Um, Thank you. We'll move now to the uh, next talk, which is by um, Lean Desson, and she will be talking about the Alma Atomium Large Program. Lean, you're there somewhere, and we have your screen. You can see everything. I can see your screen. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. So thanks for giving us, uh, I should say, the opportunity for presenting part of the Atomium Large Program uh, results. And I can continue a bit on what uh, Miguel has been saying, since what we are interested in is in how do the stars contribute in general towards the chemical evolution of the universe, towards the mass spectrum of white dwarfs and planetary nebulae, frequency distribution of supernova and the fate of exoplanets. And all of us being here, and I've seen that we are with almost 400 participants, we all should realize that one of the key parameters here is the mass loss rates that these cool aging stars do have. Eh? And so this is what I will focus on today. What do we in the, indeed understand from this mass loss rate? And I will complement a bit on the talk that just has been given by Miguel. Since for a long time, you know, these cool aging stars were thought to be, you know, a little bit boring. You know, we know how they look like. They are spherically symmetric. The good thing about them is that they have a lot of molecules. They form dust grains. And as such, they are very interesting chemical laboratories. Eh? And so we thought that, OK, we have various diagnostics, either from theoretical modeling, from observations and retrieval efforts that we do know how these stars indeed are losing their mass and as such the mass loss rate. But if you are now putting all of these predictions into one graph, you immediately can see what are the issues. So here you can see two diagrams, one for the first one for stars with some mass of two solar masses, uh, two, yeah, and the second one if stars would have an effective temperature of 2800K. And you see that various mass loss rate pres prescriptions for AGB stores do have a completely different behavior. And that's both the case for having purely theoretical models, these are the full lines, or if you would have uh, wind mass loss rate prescriptions as retrieved from observations, which are then, for instance, some of these dashed lines. It just implies that we do not know the mass loss rates of these stores, let alone that we can then also predict the further stellar evolution of which we know that the mass loss rate is one of these key parameters. And so today I will discuss one of the key parameters of which we think has been problematic in the past. And so that key parameter is just the fact that we have assumed indeed that these stars are nicely spherically uh, symmetric. That framework now appears to be really problematic. And there are various reasons for which they're problematic. And if, I hope you can see my cursor, but I will only focus now on indeed these atomic results in which do focus here on this overall uh, geometry of the stellar winds of these cool aging stars. Since indeed for a long time, it has been a puzzle about how can these spherically symmetric AGB stars what are then the mechanisms that transform these stars into the planetary nebulae, of which we know that only some 20%, and it's even some people say only 4% of them do show a spherical symmetry. So what can then be these mechanisms? And various mechanisms, mechanisms has been proposed, amongst which we have stellar rotation or magnetic fields, sometimes also aided a bit with a kind of a snow plug mechanism where you have this very fast wind of the planetary nebulae, which plugs into the smaller, the, the, the much um, lower wind of the AGB stars. The mechanism that was um, accepted the most was binarity, but was a very peculiar um, corner of your binarity space that was favored being binaries that are that do have a common envelope phase. It implies that these stars are extremely close to one another so that they have orbital periods lower than roughly some 10, 10 days. And this is indeed in that picture that you should understand the outcome of the atomium um, program. 
Atomium is an ALMA large program and we have roughly some 113 observing hours where we have observed a sample of evolved stars. And so I will only show you a little bit of the outcome of that huge program. And it is a publication, but was the results that have been published a few months ago in Science. And so I immediately start with showing you the main outcome of that one publication. This is the gallery of the winds of wet giant stars as observed with ALMA for that Atomium Large program. And you can immediately see if you now look to the winds of these evolved stars, and I do compare it again with this planetary nebulae, you see a lot of similarities in the morphologies. You have bipolar shapes. Here you can see some kind of a spiral structure. You see here we call them eyes in the sky. So what does it mean? What can we see here? And how can these data be used to unravel the mechanisms? So one conclusion can be drawn immediately if you see the similarities in morphologies, being that it is the same physics that shapes both the AGB winds and the planetary nebulae, and we have caught the mechaniz mechanisms in the act. And so we have a lot of data. I really have to say a lot. It's terabytes of data. And I cannot tell you, and I will not tell you in this 12 minutes what we have done, but we have looked at various ways through this whole set of data. We have looked to what can we see in the carbon monoxide lines. We have looked to what can we deduce from the kinematical behavior. We have seen, do we see something that could hint to bipolarity, to rotational patterns and so on. And so as I think most of us then do, you start to collect all that kind of an information in a kind of a huge sheet. sheet. And I have to admit that at some point I was completely confused since we have so many things and so much information in this ALMA data. Until one day I started color coding the outcome. And you see that if I do the color coding and you see here a, a last column that is now added to the sheet, you see that the colors are not random. I could see or we could see that some stars have a pronounced equatorial density enhancements. Other ones have a pronounced bipolar structure, while the third class do have more a pronounced spiral structure. So what is then causing this ordering in the colors? Well, these stars, as you can see them here, they are, they are ordered with respect to their mass loss rate. So whatever is giving us this nice ensemble of morphologies, the mass loss rate is one of these key parameters that is dictating this outcome. So out of these possibilities that I have proposed to you, which one can now explain uh, these morphologies? Well, the answer to that is it is indeed binarity, but binarity in a much broader sense. So we do not only focus anymore towards this very short period common envelope binaries, but you also have to include these long period binaries where we have orbits which can be above one year. So how do these binaries and interact one with the other? Well, you can see here an interaction sh uh, scheme coming from detached towards this common envelope phase. Well, one of the most important phases that I have not shown her, but that I do show now, is the fact that you also can have wind slope overflow. So what you can see here, it is that it, it's not the star itself, but it is it's, it's wind that is filling the slope. And so part of the material can then be tunneled through L1, but it's not exactly L1, it's slightly yeah, above below it. And it can create a structure around the companion. It can be an accretion disk, for instance, but you also should see that that companion can turn around, of is, is, is orbiting around the host star, and also that has an impact on the HB stellar winds. Various simulations and various groups are now really focusing in, on this very interesting topic about how can this cool AGB star, and then here you see then this binary companion, how do they interact one with another? What are then the parameters that dictate the outcome? I only show you here one simulation, and it is a simulation that is 
made by mainly by Jan Bolte here from the group in Leuven and Frederik. And so you can see, or you will see, uh, it will be a movie, but I first explain it to you. You will see the hydrodynamical model. So you will see the AGB star at this point. Three minutes left. Three yeah. minutes. <laughs> and then you will also see how this impacts the synthetic observations. And you will also, what will also happen is that we will see the configuration at various inclination angles. And so you can hear, so you can see the AGP star is pulsating. This is the temperature, CO over H2, this is the density. And you see how the companion is shaping as well the stellar winds. Now we turn around in angle, and now you can see how the carbon monoxide emission lines would, would look like here at rest frequency. And now if we go to red shifted and blue shifted observations. So this is now the struggle. We have this kind of data. Let us now work on understanding these morphologies. So it is the mass loss rate that is important. But if it is binarity, how can we then explain that since we almost never see the companion? Well, then you have to go back to population statistics. First of all, you can see here a diagram or a table that gives you a summary of the multiplicity fra fractions around stars, including also binarity, uh, including also planets. There is, there is, however, a bias in our observations, which I didn't realize until we were wor working on this data. And this is that we are always looking to AGB stars with a mass loss rate above 10 to the minus seven solar masses per year. And this is just to have good observations with high enough signal to noise. But if you're doing that, and if you then look to, into your um, statistics, then you automatically almost select stars which have an initial mass above 1.5 solar masses. But if the star has an initial mass above 1.5 solar masses, you can see here from this table that most of these stars indeed will have on average more than one companion. And then what we are now doing, and I will not, in terms of the time, I will not explain that in detail, but indeed you can also then explain why you have the correlation with the mass loss rates. So what do I still want, what do I still am after? If you now have that ID upon AGB stars and their companions, you want to have some predictive framework and say, you know, what is happening next? Eh? So we have put that into simulations where we do simulate the change of the orbital separation in function of the time on the AGB and that for different initial separations. Now, if you look to the planets and if you, that have been detected around main sequence stars, you take that statistics, then you know that most of the planets will be here in this regime, having an initial separation above 20 astronomical units. And this implies that for most of the targets, a long time on the AGB, the orbit will wi widen. And as such, this gives us this evolution scenar scenario for AGB morphologies, that as time proceeds, mass loss rate increases, and we will go from a morphology that is more disc-like towards morphology that is more spiral-like. And so one more slide, if I'm allowed, this, we, uh, first of all, this can explain a lot of other things that were already published in the literature. I just refer to the science paper for that. But if I may, I come back to the mass loss rate, since you have seen this simulation. Well, this was a simulation up initio with a companion being there. If we now do the same simulation and let it predict the mass loss rate, then you can see that without the companion, the mass loss rate is a factor of six roughly lower. So it implies that all that we have been seeing for stellar evolution, all the mass loss rates that we have been deducing, that they all might be wrong and that we should correct for our estimates on the mass loss rate. And so now I'm open for the questions that you might have. Okay, <laughs> well, thank you. Now you've, you've really thrown out a, a, a problem to everybody. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see where we're in the chat for questions. I don't see any questions at the chat at the moment, but let me take a look at the Slack. And there are six new messages. I have to scroll down through um, through 
the Slack messages here. Everyone is saying it's a wonderful talk. Now let me find <laughs> let me find some let me find some questions at the bottom here. They're not they're not rolling off my screen. Um, let me ask when it started. You started this with an Alma survey, is that right? Was this sort of over a period of years, or how did how did this work? I mean that they allow that much that the, the, all those observations. <laughs> well, I th we have started observing in. October 2019 and I think in roughly 15 months we had all observations done so this was a priority a and I think with the exception of one or two um, science blocks everything has been observed so it has I think the arm observed observatory has done a really great job they were extremely efficient and then I have a great team who is also helping with the data reduction of all of these complex data uh -huh. Now, was this a paper in in science you mentioned at one point? Yes, it is. It is. It was published it's in September 2020 in science. Okay. Lynn Hillebrand says, thank you. Wonderful, wonderful overview. And and other people are typing. I see lots of lots of questions coming in. Let me try the chat. What's happening on the chat? I don't see the questions. All I all I see are are our c congratulations, it was a beautiful, beautiful talk. You see, you've explained everything for everybody. Um, someone asked, Scott asks, uh, have you considered how to match up the AGB morphologies with uh, planetary nebulae morphologies? Yes, yes, we have done that. And so, the, so it, it does, so the morphologies do. Uh, that you can see in the AGB part, you can see them also reflected then in the planetary nebulae, but then you have to account for the different time scales and the different geometry. But so in the science paper, and I refer to that since it has a roughly 100 page supplementary with it. So in that supplementary part, you can read some examples that we have given explicitly of look at the targets, look in the atomium, look at that planetary nebulae, and you can see the similarities there. Okay, that came from Joel Kastner, okay, okay. Do, do, do you have any indication of where the mass loss is coming from? In other words, are these planes of spiral structure so that it's coming, let's say, from an equatorial plane or an orbital plane? You have, you have both. So you have, if you, the spiral is almost the most easy thing to get. So you can get a spiral for, for two reasons. First of all, if you have a quite massive companion, you have um, the, the host star, the AGB star that is wobbling around its center of mass. And if you can see maybe my hands, you almost, I hope, can feel that that kind of a shaking gives a spiral. It, is, it will be a spiral which, have, which has a very large extent with respect to the orbital plane. You can also have a second spiral that is just coming from the gravitational attraction from your companion and that is taken, uh, that is almost drawing at the, at the back of your, of your companion and you get a, kind, a spiral shock. That spiral will have a much lower extent with respect to the orbital plane. And so both of them are occurring and you can see the difference in the ALMA data, which one it is. Okay. Someone uh, uh, makes the remark that you talk about AGB winds, but you've observed red giant branch star. Could you clarify? No, no. we have observed AGB stars, but I just talk about red giants in general. Yeah. So, but this is this this was now a result on the AGB stars. We have also, and Miguel knows that some very interesting red supergiants, but they have not been published yet. Okay. But they are also not spherically symmetric, so that's obviously clear. Okay, and then Joel Kastner wants to tell everybody that there's a conference called Asymmetrical Planetary Nebulae, which number nine they think is going to be in Grenada in the fall of 2021. So there's a plug, there's some advertisement. <laughs> yes. And there's another advertisement if COVID goes fine. There is the IAU 366 conference here in Leuven on, uh, on mass loss in stars in general. Yes, is that yeah. right, right? This should be November 2021. Okay, well, thank you very much, Lee. That was that was really informative, wonderfully, and beautifully presented. Okay, it's let's it's move later. on to uh, Roberta, Roberta Humphreys from the University of Minnesota, 
is going to talk about the mass loss history of the red hypergiant, V.Y. Canis Majoris. And uh, Roberta, I will give you a three minute warning too when you th have three minutes left. <laughs> Okay, there you go. Oh, you've got to unmute, unmute. There okay, you can, you there can you see the slide? Okay, great. Yeah. Well, uh, just to begin with, Betelgeuse may be the best known red supergiant, but I'd like to suggest that V.Y. Canis Majoris is the most extreme. Uh, in this uh, very uh, short, brief presentation, I'm going to summarize results from uh, two recent papers from Hubble observations of V.Y. Canis Majoris. And also would like to mention that there is a press release today, courtesy of STSCI, on our recent Hubble observations of uh, V.Y. Canis Majoris. So you can all look at that if you want to see what the gonzo side of the story is. <laughs> Oh, it's not uh, advancing. I'm sorry, my slides are not advancing. Uh, go, go to your um, laptop or your computer and press down one. Yeah, I did. It's not advanced. Oh, there they go. It seems to be a delay here. Okay, no, all right. No. Okay, uh, next slide. Right. For those of you who are not familiar with B.Y. Canis Majoris's extreme physical characteristics. Here's a very brief summary. It's one of the most luminous red supergiants known. It's also one of the largest stars that we know about. It's a very powerful, strong infrared source and also a very powerful maser source as well. There you see on that slide uh, two images, one wide field on the total uh, nebulosity and another zoom image as well. Um, just like to emphasize that just from the picture alone from Hubble Space Telescope, the record of its high mass loss events are very obvious. Zooming in, I mean, you see, of course, the um, see, of course, the very uh, extended arcs, many arc seconds, several thousand AU from the star. Zooming in, in addition to the prominent northwest arc, several clumps of small. Uh, rather more compact knots. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, uh, we have obtained uh, both uh, two epic images, two epics of images with Hubble Space Telescope, as well as long slit spectroscopy several years ago with the Keck. I'm showing this for two reasons. First of all, the strongest emission lines in the spectra of the Y Canis Majoris are the potassium one doublet and they turn out to be the best tracers of the gas. For example, here you see two uh, two dimensional spectra of the potassium one emission line. This first one from slit three, this is the Keck observations, went across the very prominent Northwest arc. And in addition to the spatial separation, you can see the clear kinematic separation. Here you see in the potassium one emission, the Northwest arc, the gas in the Northwest arc. Slit five coming in here, going across the two prominent arcs one and two. This is very interesting because you notice this outflow of gas right here. This corresponds exactly with material associated with this arc one. And here you see associated with arc two, two evidence of two different outflows, one coming from the star itself. So from the two epics of uh, uh, HST images, we can determine the proper motions and a transverse velocity. We combine that with the Doppler velocity from the potassium one emission, and we can derive several important kinematic characteristics. First of all, of course, the total velocity uh, relative to the star, the direction, the ejecta, the orientation of the ejecta with respect to the plane of the sky and the time since the ejection. Whoops, sorry about that. I wanna point out several features with respect to uh, orientation. 
For example, arcs one and two are actually projected in front of the plane of the sky. Moving towards us, arc one's actually in front of arc two, though the northwest arc here is actually projected somewhat behind the plane of the sky. So you can get basically a 3D morphology of VY Canis Majoris from the proper motions and the radial velocity combined. I want to emphasize though that uh, those observations I've talked about uh, previously in this uh, presentation from the Keck were ground-based. So we were limited in our spatial resolution. With Keck, the best we could do was about one arc second. But as you could see, when you're looking close to the star, the uh, numerous uh, small arcs and clumps of arcs and uh, not close to the star were not separated in the Keck observations. So we went back to Hubble and got some additional stiff long slit observations using a very narrow slit. Initially here, uh, we had three slits, a uh, tenth of an arc second across, going across several small knots very close to the star that weren't resolved with the ground-based data. And again, a set of three slits going across the different uh, knots that you see to the south and southwest of the star. Well, our first observations, looking at the data from these little knots very close to the star, produced an unexpected surprise. For decades, people have seen these very strong potassium-1 emission lines, and they've always been attributed to the circumstellar envelope, the dusty circumstellar envelope surrounding the star. But when we looked at the spectrum of the star itself, right here, showing the potassium-1 lines here, and the calcium-2 infrared triplet at uh, 8,500 angstroms, no strong potassium-1 emission. But when we looked at the spectra coming from the knots just to the west of the star, this is one of them. This is not W1-A. This is where the strong potassium-1 emission was arising, as well as you can see the uh, molecular bands as, and also rubidium-1 emission. In the region of the calcium-2 triplet, yes, you see them in absorption, but for instance, these are vanadium oxide uh, band heads, and this is the dominant band of titanium oxide. This is not seen in the spectrum on the star. Instead, it's seen in the ejecta. So the problem we faced was what is the origin of the excitation? What's the excitation mechanism for the strong potassium-1 and molecular emission in these small compact knots? Well, we went when we uh, have some discussion in the paper about that, how we can explain it, but basically it requires a clear line of sight to the star. So there may be some circumstellar uh, dust immediately near the star, but yet these knots are having sight to the star's radiation. Well, just to summarize the results, so one of our uh, purposes looking at this data was to determine the time of the ejecta of the knots. And here, this summarizes for those knots very close to the star on either side of the star that we get ejection times and ages from the early 20th century. But looking again to the second work piece of work we did, we now look at the uh, slits going across the knots to the south and southwest of the star. And here are three different uh, panels showing the, third, the slits one through three, crossing several different knots. And I'm just simply summarizing for you the uh, times of ejecta from the knots that correspond with the 19th century. You see several uh, dates in the 1800s. But the optical knots are not the only ones that are present in VY Canis Majoris. ALMA observations have revealed a complex set of knots just to the east and slightly to the north of the star. These uh, from several different people, pieces of work from uh, using ALMA. What's very interesting is that you see what looks like an arc with several separate uh, peaks of emission from the ALMA observations. By the way, I wanna emphasize that they're shown here projected on the near infrared image of VY Canis Majoris from Hubble Space Telescope. This is the one micron image you see on the left. Uh, also very infrared bright is something we call the Southwest clump, which like those knots very close to the star, uh, requires basically a clear line of sight to the star to explain their infrared emission. 
uh, one of the things, of course, being ALMA observations, not optical, three we were not, were not able to determine uh, the proper motions of these ob uh, clumps, but assuming the same total emission velocity, same total velocity as the uh, uh, small clumps, which are very close to the star as well, we get an age for this clump C in the ALMA observations around 1920 to 1940. There was also another small emission of potassium-1, a small potassium-1 emission on the slit quite close to the star, which uh, again, assuming the same outflow velocity as the knots, uh, we uh, get an age for that uh, emission feature, again, lacking any proper motions, but we get an age for that emission feature that place it more recent, but in the uh, late 20th century. What I really want to focus on is the comparison of these uh, ages, the ejection times for these knots of emission uh, with the historic light curve. For example, of uh, this in three panels here, you see the upper one, this is the visual light curve from the 19th century. The middle one is the uh, photographic or blue light curve from the Harvard patrol plates and the bottom one from recent AVSO data. What I've shown on the figure is the times of ejecta from several of the different knots with these different, what you see irregularities in the light curve and several very prominent deep minima. What's interesting is that in the, I wanna particularly emphasize here in the 19th century that in 1800, B.Y. Canis Majoris was marginally naked eye, six and a half magnitude. Today, it's eight and a half with a B minus V of two. Also, you see in the upper panel that there are several times when the star showed considerable variability. I count at least three minima that the record's not complete. We don't really know what was happening before and after because the record's incomplete. But at least three deep minima when the star declined somewhere half and two magnitudes. In the middle panel in the 20th, early 20th century, several of the ejecta times correspond with a several different minima in the light curve when the star declined as much as two magnitudes. And the duration of these minima, I think is very important. Instead of being measured in days or weeks, these are measured in years, typically about three years, and some of them as long as four years. We see, of course, something similar for this more recent uh, active period with this innermost knot as well. So one of the things I wanna point out is that the star now today is two magnitudes fainter than it was 200 years ago. Obviously it formed dust. The best evidence is that that dust formation and the more permanent dimming occurred sometime between 1890 and probably 1900. Remember earlier I emphasized that those knots very close to the star have to have a clear line of sight to the star's radiation. The same is true for the knots in the infrared bright southwest clump. So instead of a uniform circumstellar shell completely obscuring B.Y. Canis Majoris, what I'd like to suggest instead is that the current obscuration is actually due to a former ejection, basically an outflow or knot of material that it was nearly in our line of sight. Remember, Bear in mind that these mass massive outflows that we see in the image were ejected not only at different times, but in different directions and with different orientations with respect to the plane of the sky. So they're coming from different regions on the surface of the star. So I'm yeah. suggesting its current uh, deep minima is a uh, deep, its current uh, faint magnitude at eight and a half is due to dust and obscuration from one of these ejections. I know there are other uh, alternatives to explain the dimming in Betelgeuse, but I think in the case of V.Y. Canis Majoris, these deep minima can probably best be explained by uh, dust formation. And when we notice that after the minima, the star returns to very close to its previous brightness. I suspect this is because the obscuring material, the outflow, the knot, is basically moving outside our, our line of sight. So it's basically moving across the disk of the star and it's moving away from the star. Okay, thank you, Roberta. I don't want to let you talk completely through your questions. Do you have one final figure? 
Well, first of all, the mass, well, one of the things we're always interested in is the mass of the knots. And based on the infrared observations of the Southwest clump, the knots in the Southwest clump and the Alma clump C, the total mass in these knots is several times 10 to the minus two solar masses. Basically more than a hundredth the mass of the sun. So about 10 times the mass of Jupiter in these individual knots. Uh, one of the questions always asked about uh, what is the origin? What's the origin of the instability? Uh, what I'd like to emphasize here is that I think it's uh, due to large scale surface activity or convective activity. And since we've now seen something similar in Betelgeuse, I mean, of course, in B.Y. Canis Majoris, it's on a much grander scale, much <laughs> grander scale. Uh, but if we see something similar going on in a more typical red supergiant, then this type of activity, convective activity, perhaps is a major source of mass loss for the red supergiants. And of course, one of the questions people always ask is what about magnetic fields? The evidence is circum sort of circumstantial, but it comes from the Maser observations. So there may be magnetic field activity associated with the surface activity. Okay, I think I'm gonna to have to cut you off because we have 60 seconds left for questions. And I want to note that uh, Louisa Rubel put your, uh, in the Slack channel, put your, um, put your uh, you know, the press release and that's there. <laughs> it's a rather bit, bit gonzo, but anyway. <laughs> Okay, um, now someone asks whether light curves such as tests would be helpful in figuring out which ejection event candidates are worth slit observations to build a larger sample. In other words, if we're looking at photometry with let's say tests at some of these stars and when we find an event, then we should quick <laughs> you know, go to it with a slit observation. Well, yes, definitely. The fact, that's one of the problems I would have if following up, if V.Y. Canis Majoris did it again. Uh, well, what I'm suspicious of is like, like a case of uh, Betelgeuse. Maybe the outburst, the actual ejection of the, uh, of the gas, uh, the outflow may actually occur before the dimming. Well, uh, you're not the only one to have thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, by the time we see a dip in the uh, light curve that may be significant, it may be too late to get the spectrum. Yeah, okay. Uh, get one question from uh, Arapetian. What is the wind terminal velocity? And then we've got to move to the haikus. The, the which, the what? Wind velocity? terminal velocity. It, okay, well, the escape velocity for V.Y. Canis Majoris is about uh, 70 kilometers per second. Okay. We haven't measured a wind terminal velocity. Okay, okay, fine. We're measuring well, the velocity, the space velocities of these ejecta. Yeah, okay, okay, great. Well, I love the okay. fact that it's coming from different parts of the star, which I think tells us something about Betelgeuse. Okay, thank you, Roberta. We've got to move on. I'm going to turn over to Scott, and this is haiku time. And we'll be back in about 10 minutes. Well, uh, we're, we're not going anywhere. Let me just make sure I have my, the haiku lined up, which I do, and share sound lined up, which I do. And again, um, Andrea, if you can hear this, give me the thumbs up. I can hear you, yes. No, 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 the video. I don't hear the video. The formation of lithium yes, I do. giants has been an evolutionary puzzle for decades. Several mechanisms have been proposed to explain their existence, but it's not clear which mechanism or mechanisms are responsible. One proposed mode of lithium enhancement is rotationally induced mixing, which suggests these stars should be rapidly rotating. However, this is challenging to observe spectroscopically. The effects of macro turbulence can mask the expected signal of a few kilometers per second for FL stars. The Kepler field hosts more than 100 lithium rich giants. Because of their large radii, a few kilometer per second equatorial velocity would imply a rotation period of about 100 days. Variability on this timescale in Kepler data is typically removed by the Kepler pipeline in its attempt to clean the light curve of instrumental systematics. We've developed routines to re-reduce Kepler data specifically to preserve these slow signals. This enables us to find rotation periods even longer than 100 days, this one's about 120 days, in Kepler data, so we can explore the rotation distribution of these lithium-rich giants. To find out more, come check out my poster. Hello, I'm Adam Finlay and I recently completed my PhD with Sean Matt at the University of Exeter in the UK, where he focused on modelling how stellar winds remove angular momentum from stars like the Sun. 
By using in situ measurements of the solar wind, we can provide a valuable constraint for models that attempt to explain the rotation evolution of sun like stars, that is, the rate at which angular momentum is lost through the solar wind. We have explored data from Park Solar Probe and Solar Orbiter, and our main findings are that, firstly, the solar wind angular momentum flux, although highly variable, is comparable with previous observations when we use sufficient averaging to remove local fluctuations. And secondly, there is a strong trend of angular momentum flux with solar wind speed, which has the fast wind typically carrying oppositely directed angular momentum to the slow wind. In future, we hope to be able to make multi-spacecraft observations of the solar wind angular momentum flux, along with measurements outside of the ecliptic plane using Solar Orbiter. I will upload this slide as a poster for you all to look at. Thank you for your time. Hello, everyone. I'm Shreya Shete, and my work is focused on understanding the internal nucleosynthesis inside asymptotic giant brown stars or AGP stars. For this purpose, we developed a new tool which disentangles the complex uh, parameter space of AGP stars by using high resolution data and the Gaia parallaxes. Later, by using the well constrained stellar parameters, we located the AGP stars in the HR diagram and discovered some low mass AGP stars. These are stars with sun-like masses and sun-like metallicities showing evidences of heavy element production, which was unaccounted for by the TP AGB models previously. We also then compared the chemical status of these AGB stars with their evolutionary status and found a very nice agreement between the uh, heavy elements production in these stars and their evolutionary status or their location in the HR diagram. After the end of the main sequence and on their way to the red giant branch, low mass stars pass through the subgiant phase of evolution. I'm going to have to stop there because there's the, we just got the haiku out of sync, the picture and the sound. So we'll come back to that in a little bit. Andrea, why don't you go to the next um, talk? You, you are now muted, I think. You. There we go. OK. okay. All I'm right. going to go off and fix that. And um, uh, I'll text you, Andrea, when it's all set and ready. OK, we can do it after. I have two, we have two talks now. Yeah. We have some new results. Marcus Witkowski is going to talk about investigating mass loss from red supergiants and AGB stars using the new mid-infrared Matisse imaging instrument at the VLTI. Hi, Marcus, and it's all yours. And I'll give you, oh, you're, you're muted. I'll give you a three minute warning. Uh, I'm not hearing any uh, audio. Did he unmute? No, he's still muted. Asked to unmute. Yeah, I've tried asked to unmute. I can't get a hold of him. Can you hear me now? Oh, now it's okay. Yep, you did it. Okay, and we can probably say so we can see you too. Good. Okay. I think. Great. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, <laughs> Sorry are. for the hiccup. Um, um, yeah, so thank you for giving me the opportunity to present these uh, results obtained with the BLT interferometer on uh, red supergiants and LGB stars. Um, I think we have heard already uh, introductions, so let me skip this. Uh, the open questions essentially is that we uh, would like to understand how the atmosphere is elevated uh, in these kind of stars. Are the physical processes missing? Which is the dust condensation sequence? How does the mass loss relate to stellar parameters? Which is the composition of the dust? And also, which is the effect of close companions, but what I'm not uh, addressing today. Uh, so here we see a sketch of a Myra star. Um, with the stellar surface surrounded by an extended molecular atmosphere and then the dust formation zone and the wind. Um, and these different regions can be probed with different instruments. Um, 
And um, if we want to study the very inner part where the mass loss is initiated, uh, we can observe only the very few apparently larger stars with uh, instruments like a, a sphere or ALMA to resolve the photosphere. Um, but for a larger sample, we require optical interferometry to do this. Um, <clears throat> and in particular, there are two instruments that are very interesting here at the VLTI, which is the pioneer instrument it's in the H-band that can observe the um, stellar photosphere and the Matisse instrument that can uh, observe the extended atmosphere in the dust envelope. Um, of course, there are also instruments that other interferometers I'm concentrating on the VLTI here. Um, Miguel has already given an introduction to the VLTI, so I don't have to say much. Basically, we have uh, four eight meter telescope and four 1.8 meter telescopes. And for these stars, we use the smaller 80s. Um, there's different configurations that we can use to image them. Uh, we reach spatial resolutions between about one milli arc second in the H band to 10 milli arc seconds uh, in the N band. And there's the three different instruments, Pioneer, Gravity, Matisse, at the different uh, wavelengths bands. Um, and just to note, the call for proposal for the next period is out. If anybody's interested, the deadline is 25th <laughs> of March. Um, before I come to Matisse uh, data, I'd like to show uh, some previous results on red supergiants. Uh, so this is VY Canis uh, Majoris that we observed with gravity. Um, and we uh, saw a bumpy visibility curve that you see on the top uh, left. Um, and this uh, indicates uh, that there are extended atmospheric layers of CO and water. And it resembles what we have seen in Myra stars before, which you see in the, on the right, the graph on the right, where we observed a Myra star. And we also see this bumpy uh, visibility curve that indicates extended molecular layers. And here the blue curve is a dynamic model atmosphere that um, uh, is consistent with, uh, with this. So they naturally include extended molecular layers. We also see a strong closure phase signal showing uh, that there are strong asymmetries in the star. And uh, on the top, uh, on the bottom left, we see that the visibility curve doesn't go to unity, which means, as we know, that there is a strong background component which is over resolved uh, with the VLTI, and that leads to the visibility below uh, one. Um, uh, and maybe what's also interesting to note is uh, that uh, if we see a different wavelength, uh, we only look at some wavelengths close to the photosphere, like at 2.2 microns, and then to the right and to the left of this, we go into molecular layers, meaning the star appears much larger. So if we um, uh, use broadband observations, we will overestimate the photospheric diameter because we are looking at those more extended molecular layers. And that also helped us to revise the photospheric radius of the star to like 1,420 stellar radii. Um, then uh, we continued uh, with this on AGB stars. So here's again a Myra star, which we now compared to uh, codex dynamic model atmospheres, which was new compared to the previous uh, plot, and also to Asimusili average intensity based on COBOT 3D IHD simulations, uh, which you see in both, uh, one in blue and the other in red. Uh, and the observations confirmed that we see spatially extended molecular atmospheres above the continuum. And both modeling attempts provided satisfactory fits to the data. This is for Myra stars. Uh, and this also confirms that shocks induced by convection and pulsation in the 3D cobalt models of AGB stars are roughly spherically expanding and they are of similar nature as those of the self excited pulsations in the 1D models, uh, which was interesting there. And I find this quite instructive. So these are the model intensity profiles of these 3D models, uh, where you see on top uh, band paths in water vapor band, and then in near continuum and then in CO. And in the near continuum in the second from top, 
you see the stellar surface without much surroundings. But if you go to smaller or to larger wavelengths, you go into the water vapor bands and into the CO bands, and you see these extended molecular layers, which are like twice the radius uh, of the star. So they are really very extended, and they show up naturally uh, for the AGB stars in the models. Um, so at this time, I thought, uh, since uh, observationally, red supergiants and uh, AGB stars look very similar. The models will also do something similar, but this was uh, wrong. So when we observed a red supergiant in the same way, um, we confirmed that also the red supergiants have these extended molecular layers, but the 3D RHD models, they do not show for red supergiants, now for the parameters of red supergiants, they do not show any such extended layers at all. So why they naturally appeared for the AGB stars, uh, they do not predict it by far for the red supergiants. So on the bottom here, uh, you see the intensity profile of such a model in the continuum in black and in red for the CO. And it's maybe marginally more extended by one or two percent, but nothing like this two stellar radii that we have seen before for the AGB stars. Um, so we don't know how for red supergiants the atmosphere is uh, levitated. Um, there were some ideas that we have. One is radiatively driven extension uh, by radiation pressure on molecular lines, which goes back to Jocelyn and Place. And this might be supported by this graph that you see where we plot uh, basically a measure of the atmospheric extension versus luminosity. And the more luminous the star, the more the atmosphere is extended. So that might confirm um, a radiative component. Another thing could be that there's acceleration on dust grains that may form already close to the stellar photosphere, but still we need to levitate them a bit to, to get to any dust radii, which might be two stellar radii or maybe a bit closer, but not right at the stellar surface. And uh, other mechanism that has been uh, discussed are alphane wave driven winds. Um, and now with the dimming of Betelgeuse, which we have heard today, um, which is interpreted as uh, due to discrete highly localized mass ejection events, be it just gas or dust, but it's highly localized. And it could be connected to photospheric uh, motion by stochastic occurrence of an extreme convection cell. This is what I understand. Uh, and uh, from, from what we have heard today and described in these uh, references. And also we have heard from Roberta Humphreys that such discrete mass ejection events may also explain the massless history of the red supergiant E. Vicanis majoris and of red supergiants in general. And I think this is very plausible that uh, this helps because uh, maybe for average conditions, we cannot levitate the atmosphere, but if there's uh, once every time some uh, stochastically, uh, some extreme convective motion, then this might help to get the uh, uh, atmosphere levitated. Yeah, three minutes, you've got three. Then we can observe, okay, we can observe uh, the surface structure of red supergiants. So here you see pioneer images of one of our sample. Um, and um, we also see again extended molecular layers, which are not very visible in the images, but we see them in the visibilities. Um, and we compared them to, um, uh, again, to 3D RHD simulations by Bernd Freitag and Andrea Kiawasa. And on the left, you see uh, most similar snapshots on the top. And then we convolved them to the spatial resolution that we have. In the middle panel and the lower panel is again the observation. And you see that the morphology can, I mean, we cannot expect to find a snapshot that exactly resembles any particular observation, but at least uh, it looks uh, very similar. So we, we can um, explain uh, the observed surface features by such uh, 3D models. And also on the right, in terms of contrast, uh, the red blue curve is the contrast from the models and the two black curves is the contrast at the two epochs that we observe. And I mean, it's a bit on the lower side, but it's kind of consistent. 
Um, then I come to the Matisse observations, which is pretty much a work in progress. So we observed the red supergiant AH uh, Scopy. It's part of our sample. We have a good distance. Uh, it's known to have a strong narrow silicate feature at 9.7 microns. We have a photospheric uh, radius. We know it has a strong atmospheric extension. Uh, we previously had a pioneer image that wasn't published because the UV coverage is not very good. So I'm not as confident as for the published ones, but I think it's kind of okay. Um, which you see on the lower right. And then when we come to Matisse, we observe in the L-band in medium spectral resolution and in the N-band at low resolution. So, and you see the visibility curves, we see different features. Uh, so this bumpy visibility curve between 3.6 and four microns, we believe is due to water on, and or H lines. And then we see this dip in the SIO to zero band and here we also see a closure phase signal. So that means that SIO is extended and it's also asymmetric. And we see in the N-band, um, um, yeah, this visibility curve. And I can show you preliminary image reconstructions. So we filled the UV plane. And uh, this is what we preliminarily obtained in the L-band. Uh, and you see that the star looks more compact at like 3.9 microns. And then in the SIO bandhead at 4.008, for example, it looks uh, more extended. So that means we see uh, extended, as we already guessed, extended SIO shell. We see it more clearly if we uh, compare this pseudo continuum and the SIO bandhead, which is like a factor of 1.5 or two larger, might also be a bit more extended to the north and to the south. Um, and I believe that uh, in this pseudo continuum at 3.9, we also do not see the stellar surface, but we see already extended layers of water. Um, and in the N band, we also see a more extended dust shell towards 12 microns. So we still have to, I mean, it's preliminary, we still have to characterize it and uh, compare it to models, um, but we see this evolution of size uh, with wavelengths from eight microns where we see closer to the star and 12 microns where we look at the uh, silicate dust. And if we put this together, we see this pioneer image on the uh, upper left, which we believe is a photospheric uh, layer. And then you see that already at 3.9, it's the same scale. The star is already larger, probably due to these uh, extended water layers. And then we see the silicate feature even larger. Um, and then uh, the, the, the dust shell uh, in the bottom images. So this is a way hopefully to trace uh, uh, the, um, the mass loss from the photosphere out to the molecular layers and into the dust. It's all work in progress at the moment. So I hope to show you more in one of the next meetings. Okay. Um, and just to show again for Myra stars, this is our quarry, it looks very similar. So it's again the same phenomenon that observationally uh, red supergiants and uh, Myras look very similar. Okay. So Thank to you, Marcus. Um, Let's we don't that understand up here. I think, the I think... process of fully evolved stars, particularly for red supergiants. Um, where the models based on convection and pulsation alone cannot reproduce the observed extensions uh, by far. Uh, we uh, have seen that Pioneer is an excellent uh, instrument to image the stellar surface of these stars. And the Matisse instruments at LM and N can link uh, from the stellar surface from Pioneer to the molecular layers and the dust formation zones. And we include important lines such as SIO gas and uh, uh, silicate dust. And we also see a significant fraction of the flux, um, which is much more extended. And yeah, again, red supergiants and AGB stars are observationally very similar, but theoretically, apparently uh, not. Okay, I think, Marcus, you. you've managed to talk yourself through your presentation and all your questions. You are muted. So uh, I'm, 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 we're very impressed with the capabilities of the, um, that are down at Parallel. Really impressive. And there are some questions and already answers in the chat section. 
So people have weighed in on the questions with the answers. So I'm going to say thank you. And then to keep on schedule, I'm going to move to the next the last um, uh, contribution before we go back to the haikus again. And that is um, from Lars Matson, who will tell us about gas dust drift and why we need to think about that in AGB winds. Lars, are you there? You're there. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, can you see my slides? I, I sure can. Yeah, good. I'll give you a three minute warning. Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, quick outline. Um, I'm going to tell you, uh, give you a very quick review of the AGB wind modeling, and uh, we're going to present a new uh, wind model or wind modeling code, which we call P800. Uh, and I will summarize some uh, first results from that code and present some conclusions on that. So first of all, uh, a stellar wind model requires that you describe a large part of an AGB star. Uh, for example, the, we have already seen the Cobalt 5, um, the Cobalt models here where, where you can see all these convection bubbles and everything, which is in, important 3D aspects of uh, these stars. So they aren't really spherical or symmetric, at least not in that zone. And this is also where the pulsation of the star originates. Uh, moving outwards to the part where we are mostly interested in here, uh, you have the dynamical atmosphere. That's where you accelerate the wind. And outside of that, you have a circumstellar envelope, where, which is then hitting the ISM eventually. So what we're going to be concerned with here mostly is this uh, green region here. And that's also where the drift occurs uh, to begin with. And then it can get somewhat worse when it gets farther out. Uh, I shouldn't say worse, but you can get more drift, that's what I'm trying to say. So a stellar wind forms um, by the interaction between the components here, which is dust and gas and radiation. So there are basically three components. And the mechanism is uh, that you accelerate the gas by radiated pressure and dust grains are also accelerated radi by radiation. And then the dust grains has dragged the gas along. So you have a drag force, which is the key uh, player here. Um, and that drag force depends on a num uh, number of parameters, as you can see here. Then. But if we, look at what has been done before, what I have done before and what a lot of other people have done before. Um, take here the example, the code, well, it wasn't called Darwin at that point, but when I did my PhD thesis, I worked with the Sun and Huffner's code. And there you assume the drift velocity is zero. And that's what actually most people do. And uh, I think the main reason for this is that life is easier that way because modeling drift is complicated as I'm going to show here. And besides, uh, um, there is a general good, uh, generally a good agreement between um, observed mass loss rates and wind speeds and what uh, these non-drift models actually produce. So from that point of view, it may seem that you don't need a drift, but I'm going to argue that you actually do for various reasons. So then let me present the uh, Terminator code or the T800 as we call it. I'm not going to go explain why we have uh, named it this way. It's a long story, but it's basically three components. One is the actual code for simulation code and one uh, part is for creating hydrostatic atmospheres to start from. And then there is a rather advanced visualization and analysis tool two also, and all these three components are hopefully going to be available to the community at some point, but there are not available right now, unfortunately. So what are the assumptions that we make in this model? Well, to uh, decide whether you want, want to have frequency uh, dependent or gray radiated transfer, when, uh, or how we, if you're willing to pay the price of having uh, frequency dependent radiative transfer because it gets more expensive and drift is complicated. But we decided that we should uh, because if there, it was demonstrated more than 20 years ago by Susanna uh, that the 
pressure gradients, density gradients, temperature gradients, and all of things actually become very different when you use mean opacities as opposed to frequency dependent opacities when you calculate your radiative transfer. So that's all, and we can see that in our, in our um, um, hydrostatic um, models as well. So this is clearly an important starting point. Uh, also, when you talk about the dust, uh, that's where you get most of the opacity. Um, and uh, we have to decide upon what, what um, um, prop the optical properties of uh, the dust and uh, different measurements that you can use. And you also have to decide on uh, whether you're going to use the so-called small particle approximation or if you're going to use full me theory uh, or in this case, actually some kind of approximate mean theory based upon mean, mean uh, grain sizes. Uh, and we're, we're trying both actually, both the small particle approximation and mean theory. And we have to make assumptions about um, dust formation, the chemistry. Unfortunately, we have only been able to try carbon rich chemistry so far, but the code is fully capable of doing oxygen rich, rich chemistry as well. Yes, we don't have the opacity tables. That's the problem right now. And then we have to um, assume properties of the dust. And uh, most importantly here, we are not setting the um, sticking probability uh, in, in this net in the dust formation to unity, which is sometimes done because that seems to um, solve some problems. But on the other hand, it, it's not very likely and experiments are showing much smaller uh, numbers actually. So we use those numbers instead. Um, yeah, so then how about the acceleration of dust? Yeah, I've explained the drag already. This is another thing. Um, so we have to assume something, a few things on the drag force uh, like particle geometry and we assume the particles are sphere, um, spheres. And uh, you have to assume certain things about the dynamical conditions and what, what type of collisions you have. And we assume only spe specular collisions here, uh, which seems reasonable in many ways. But then we come to the radiative transfer. And this is really one of the key aspects here. Uh, so we're using this um, method outlined in, by Mihalas. Um, based upon moments, and the, you probably know all this. Um, you've seen it, you have <laughs> read about it in many other books, I suppose. And um, what we have, what is new in our code is that we, as opposed to what has been done before, where uh, at least uh, the Darwin code, for example, used the, the scheme by York from 1980, we are using the Fourier method and without any approximations. And we calculate uh, this in spherical geometry uh, at all time steps in, in the entire domain. That's a little bit expensive, but it's actually worth it because uh, everything gets much more stable this way. Um, yeah, and the, there's another thing here, and that radiated transfer plus drift will give us a stiff system of equations that requires implicit solution. And then you have to ask the question whether you're supposed to use an adaptive grid or a fixed grid. And we are arguing that you should use a um, higher resolution fixed grid because the adaptive grid will never know uh, which shocks to resolve and how to deal with shocks forming in the dust phase and shocks forming in the gas phase when the dust and the gas decouple, as it will, when you have two different components with two um, different equations of motion. And uh, if you, the, the main thing here is that you, you can see that there are lots of wiggles here in, in these plots where we have using the adaptive grid and lots of that goes away and it seems to be art, artificial noise or whatever um, due to the use of the grid equation together with this two fluid approach. But this high resolution fixed grid and um, radiated frequency dependent radiative transfer and drift and all that, it gets expensive. So on a single call, you would need uh, about a year to run one time sequence here, time series. 
and that's not very practical. So you have to parallelize. But fortunately, because we use no uh, frequency redistribution, you can parallelize um, the radiated transfer quite efficiently and run on, on, I think we use 160 cores or something like that. And suddenly you, you can do one model in a few days, which is okay. It's difficult if you want to do a grid of models, but still is reasonable. We have three minutes left. Thank you. So let me now move on to some results here. Uh, here, some you can see some examples of uh, distribution of grid points. Not very interesting, but you can see that there is this. We're definitely resolving the shocks even um, with a fixed grid. Um, if you compare um, radial structures of the uh, position coupled models, where you assume there is no um, drift, uh, you can see that the you have more vari they are more variable than the drift models that seem to be more stable various reasons. but there are exceptions actually but that's the general thing that we see so so the um the, the yellowish lines here are the uh, uh, position coupled models and the other ones are uh, for the drift models um Another thing which we noticed, we would scratch our head a bit uh, with this, was that there seemed to be a dust formation going on very far out, and we couldn't explain this in the beginning. But then we realized that this is not really what's going on here. This is an effect of drift. There's actually no dust formation out there. And so, so the gradients are basically changing also. The dust uh, condensation gradient and uh, how did the apparent um, rain radius um, as a function of stellar radius here um, would change due to drift? It's something that, that I don't have time to explain the details here, I realize now, but it's a quite interesting phenomenon anyway. Um, there are also examples of cases where you get more variation with a drift model which has turned out to be something that is maybe related to uh, numerics, but we also see that this is when happens when the uh, drift velocity is very um, variable, then everything gets very unstable in the model. Uh, so there are um, counter um, cases here. So it's not always that you get a more stable outflow with the drift model. And uh, we also, like I said, we tried a me theory uh, and compared with the small particle approximation. Um, I don't think we, there's so much more to say about that. There, here's another interesting thing where we had a model which didn't form any wind, but you had this extreme drift velocity for a while where it basically had a, a, a dust blast shooting out from the star, which is a rather interesting phenomenon. That we haven't seen before. And uh, when we compare the mass loss rate um, with observations, we seem to be in the right ballpark. There are some, the data points are jumping around a bit, whether you're using drift or not using drift, or whether you're using me theory or not, and, but we're still in the right ballpark. And we tend to be in this uh, drift dominated regime as defined by Elitzer and Ibisic. And uh, we would compare with other uh, previous theoretical models, still seem to be a lot of agreement. Here's one thing, one, again, the, the data points are moving around. So sometimes you, uh, data, when you add drift, the data point moves away from the correlation here, but it, then it moves back when you add uh, meat theory, which is quite interesting. Um, Another thing to keep in mind is that you need to correct these plots a bit uh, due to um, uh, um, the, the drift factor, the, the amount of drift that you have actually. And when we do that, it actually looks a little bit better. Um, yeah, there's also a lot, of, you know, a lot of parameters that correlate with something we call the, uh, the drift factor, which is basically the dust to gas velocity. Since I'm running out of time, I'm unfortunately not going to be able to talk about that, which is quite interesting, but I will move to the conclusions instead and, and say that high sp spatial resolution, me theory and drift are all things needed 
to understand when formation of AGB starts. We cannot leave out drift. It's very expensive when you do modeling, but it's definitely needed. Okay. Uh, and then, uh, drift would be important when, uh, to get stellar evolution and dust yields right. That's something I really want to emphasize. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Let's see, there are a few questions. Someone, uh, Ellis Avalone wants to know, how are global stellar magnetic fields affected by AGB winds and enhanced mass loss at these late <laughs> yeah, that, that's a very That's a very tough question. Uh -huh. um, we, don't, we don't use any magnetic fields uh, in these models at all. Uh, but but uh, definitely would be interesting to um, add that, especially uh, if you would couple this with some circumstellar envelope model uh, yeah. magnetic fields. That could be interesting. Um, but we're not looking, we haven't looked at it at all. So I yeah. I don't know really what to say now. You don't have chromospheres in your models either. In other words, they're basically, <laughs> there's a lot else going on. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Indeed. This is not a final thing. Okay, uh, I think you've managed to use up your 15 minutes between the questions <laughs> and, and the others. So I will uh, thank you, Lars, for a fascinating, complicated calculations. And we'll turn it over to Scott. We can have the rest of the haikus now, I believe, and then pick up at uh, two o'clock with uh, Nate Bastian. Scott, are you ready? I think so. You should be able to see my screen. And uh, again, um, let me know if you can't hear this. After the end of the main sequence and on their way to the red giant branch, low-mass stars pass through the subgiant phase of evolution, which is a particular phase of evolution with rapid structural change, which means it's a great place to test our understanding of the physics of stellar interiors and the interactions between the cores and the envelopes. In the, with data from the test continuous viewing zones, we can study these stars in detail using photometry, astrometry, spectroscopy, and astroseismology. And in particular, the astroseismology gives us access to the rotation periods of the cores of these stars. When we compare in detail the rotation periods that we measure for these stars as a function of evolutionary coordinate and stellar mass, we find that we don't exactly match the predictions of any of the currently physically motivated models of stellar rotational evolution, neither the Fuller et al. enhanced Taylor Spurt Dynamo nor differentially rotating convection zones can match what we observe. Good afternoon. I'm Thomas Granzer of the Leibniz Institute for Astrophysics in Potsdam. And I want to present you in this poster some long-term data on Betelgeuse. What you can see in green is the radial velocity data from our robotic 1.2 meter telescope Stella on Tenerife. In violet and red, you can see data from the bright photometric satellites. And for comparison, overplotted is the AAVSO Johnson V data in blue. What you immediately can see that the RV curve basically follows the photometry quite tightly, which is also true at the grand dimming event. But here you can see that the radial velocity lags roughly 30 days behind the photometric curve. You can also see that we have another dip uh, here in December 2020, where we have also a very heavy infall event, which shows no sign whatsoever in photometry. If you want to see more, please visit. For a long time, short period planets around evolved stars have been underappreciated and underexplored. But thanks to the NASA test mission, we now know of more of these systems than ever before. And some of these new systems have incredibly short periods as well, implying that they're very susceptible to orbital decay. In fact, when comparing these confirmed systems to those most amenable to a search for orbital decay, you can see that these new test systems, shown as squares, have some of the shortest orbital decay rates of any known planets. These decay rates then constrain the stellar tidal quality factor, Q star, which is determined directly by the system orbital properties, but also constrains aspects of the internal stellar structure, such as the radiative convective boundary of the star, as well as the hydrogen and helium fractions in the outer convective envelope. So ultimately, by characterizing short period planets around evolved stars, 
we can constrain features of stellar structure and evolution that are otherwise inaccessible. I'm Sam Grundblatt, and thanks for listening. Through this project, we wanted to better understand why some red giants show magnetic activity. Thanks to a unique combination of asteroseismic analysis performed on 4,500 red giants observed by Kepler and complementary high-resolution spectroscopic data, we showed that there are three distinct groups. Giants in closed binary systems that are spun up by tidal forces, club stars that engulfed a stellar or substellar companion while they were on the red giant branch, and intermediate mass stars that were simply fast rotators on the main sequence. We use high resolution spectra of the solar twin HIP 11915 and the Sun in order to determine high precision abundances with a precision of 0.01 dex. The abundance pattern of this solar twin is different from the sun. In particular, we can see that the even elements are more abundant than the odd elements. For the first time, we show that the odd even abundance pattern in a solar twin is different from the sun. This can be explained by the contamination of a supernova from a star of 13 solar masses with subsolar metallicity. You can find more details in our published paper. Thank you. Okay, Andrea, back to you. Audio. Not back to me. We're moving to the two o'clock session, and Sasha is sharing that, right? Okay, so why don't we take a five minute break now? And um, Sasha will take over and start Cool Stars 21 in about five minutes. Okay. Can you scan that, that group photo for us? Um, so the group photo is posted in the random part of okay. the sl uh, Slack channel. I think that's a full resolution. Somebody helped themselves to improving it. And I'm trying to get a, I will either do what they did over again because I, they had a really clever idea that I didn't think to do, um, or I'll, I'll use what they sent me. But why don't we take about a four minute break here and then we can be all synced up at two o'clock. Is that okay with you, Sacha? All right, now I'll, I'll leave this image or a version of this image up um, until Sacha takes control of the screen in four minutes. If I can figure out how to do that. I notice no one in this picture is smiling. So next time I will tell you to smile for 15 minutes while we take all these pictures.
Okay, Scott. Sorry. Chris Bruin is a co-host now. Hi, Nate. <clears throat> Hello, can you hear me? Yes, uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to start with a short uh, communication about uh, Cool Start 21, okay? Okay, and sounds good. And then uh, you, will, uh, you will go ahead, all right? Sounds good. I will uh, tell you a few minutes, like four minutes before the end to give enough time for you to have questions, you know? Okay? Yep. So yeah. it may sound short because you have to take it. I have to warn you before we start questioning. Yeah. And it just to be, it's 25 plus five or so. Uh, right? Yeah, 24 plus six, but uh, anyway. Okay. Uh, yeah, and that 24 plus six should be fine as well. Yeah, yeah. But I could give one minute, okay? Yeah. Should I share my screen? Or do you have something to show? Uh, not quite, yes. Um, I, will, I will do that. I wait for Scott to come back, I guess. No, I'm, I'm back, I'm back. Uh, you're back, okay, yeah, so, so then. I... We're ready to go here. Um, why don't you, Sacha, introduce yourself and uh, give your um, Start Cool Stars 21 going. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you for being here and attending this great conference. Um, we are going to, to, to start a few minutes with a, a short presentation on Cool Start 21. As you know, this uh, virtual conference is because we had to postpone Cool Start 21, as uh, Scott and, uh, told us uh, uh, two days ago. So I'm going to share my screen uh, normally. Uh, okay, here. Uh, and then uh, you should uh, be able to, to see that, um, the, um, the conference. Okay, so um, Cool Star Conference will be on the, from the 4th to the 9th of July, 2022. Uh, you should be able to go on this website, so HTTPS, Cool Star. And uh, we, uh, this is a message from the, the log. So to give you a little bit more details about CoolStar, which will which should have happened in 2020, uh, as you know. So the, we, this will happen in the Toulouse Conference Center. So this is France, Paris is here, and uh, Toulouse is in the southwest part of France. And within Toulouse, we will be at uh, the Pierre Baudis Convention Center. This is the main center of the city. You can see there is a big amphitheater here. So there will be free social events at the conference in Toulouse. Uh, there will be an icebreaker on Monday that will be uh, taken very close to the conference center in downtown Toulouse. We will have on uh, Tuesday evening, uh, Professor Mayer and Didier Kellos, the Nobel Prize uh, speaking normally. 
Uh, and uh, Michel said, yes, Didier, we are waiting, but uh, normally he will come as well. And on Thursday, we will have a, a conference dinner uh, a bit further away uh, from, from uh, Toulouse uh, in a big place where there are uh, planes, as you know, uh, Toulouse is famous for food, but also for aeronautics, Airbus uh, is, is there mostly. Okay, so we want to tell everybody that uh, don't wait to register and to, because we will have a, a limit to 500 persons in the conference uh, in person. And uh, so it's important for you to, to, to register early if you want to be sure to attend. So some key dates for Cool Stars 21. So uh, we will, uh, in early October of this year, 2021, call for splinter sessions. And the deadline will be the 10th of December. Uh, I want to say to people who have already proposed printer session for uh, uh, the 2020 event that uh, we are going to reopen the printer session. So, of course, we will keep track of the one who have already applied, if they reapply, uh, but uh, we can promise they will be selected again. It's, uh, we want to reopen the competition because uh, four years have passed by, so it may be important to reopen. But of course, you're most welcome to reapply and we will consider that highly. Uh, early birds fees uh, registration will start in January 2022. And uh, for people needing travel grants, we have a little bit of travel grants. Please uh, uh, propose, uh, submit a travel grant. Of course, it's mostly for young uh, students, postdocs, and people uh, living far away uh, from Europe, uh, and not for. Uh, people who are from wealthy countries, let's say. Um, early March, uh, abstract submission deadline, and then uh, we will have uh, uh, various registration that will increase. So uh, late March, normal registration fees. So if you want the early birth fees, uh, register on me uh, early. And so um, conference again for the 4th to the 9th. And uh, please go on the website you will see uh, the uh, possibility to, uh, to be in the pre-mailing list. Then I'm going to finish with that. So thank you to Scott, Andrea, Maurice, Sean, and James for a great cool start 25, 20.5. And we are all looking uh, for you to be in Toulouse in about 16 months. Uh, thank you very much. So now I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And uh, Nate, uh, you can start. Thank you. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, we do. Okay, great. Do you see my pointer? I should have asked that previously. Yes, as well. Okay, fantastic. All right, well, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to speak to you today to a community that uh, we often don't touch on very much and uh, share the excitement that uh, many people working on stellar clusters feel about multiple populations. And so globular clusters have been studied now for hundreds of years, and some of the earliest uh, people to really note their existence and study them in some detail go back to William Herschel, who in 1814 said globular clusters are undoubtedly the most interesting objects in the heavens. And my goal here today is to agree with that, but also say that within the globular cluster topic, multiple populations are the most interesting topic. And the reason for that, and why I'm so excited to be here to talk with you today, is that very rarely in astrophysics are you exposed to a problem where we really have no idea what's going on. This is a very well-developed problem that has a long history of observational studies, but we're really back to square one in terms of explaining where they come from. And this is uh, summarized nicely by Aaron Dodder and collaborators who call multiple populations a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. So while globular clusters have been studied uh, in detail now for well, hundreds of years, the last few decades have actually shown uh, uh, some very big surprises and really changed our view of uh, what globular clusters are. So here is a, uh, a color magnitude diagram of a, globular, a galactic globular cluster, NGC 2808, uh, that basically this was the best you could do with WIFPIC2 on HST in the late 90s. What you see here is all the standard phases, you see the main sequence, you see the subgiant branch, the red giant branch and horizontal branches. You know, this is uh, basically exactly what you expect from a simple, an old simple stellar population. However, with the advent of the advanced camera uh, for surveys on HST, the, the situation changed radically. 
So if we would zoom in um, on the main sequence with ACS, where you could actually proper, uh, clean the CMDs for proper motion, you see something like this. So this is uh, what we're referring to as multiple populations, where in this particular case, you see three largely discrete main sequences lying right next to each other. And so this is what I'm referring to by multiple populations. And the origin of this, as I say, is currently unknown. Now, the other big surprise is that around the Milky Way, we often thought of globular clusters as being some of the oldest objects in the universe. They're in the halo or bulge, and they're uh, attributed to the early phases of galaxy assembly. So this is just one example. This is Omega Sen, the most massive globular cluster in the Milky Way. This is a few million solar masses, age of about 12 giga years. However, with HST, and again, the advanced camera for survey in particular, when we started zooming in on nearby starburst galaxies or uh, colliding galaxies like the antennae, here we see two spiral galaxies, you can see here, are coming together merging, causing a huge starburst. And inside that starburst, you're not just forming stars, but in fact, you're forming massive stellar clusters as well. So if you zoom in on this uh, region here, this is so-called not S. This is a cluster with a few million solar masses, so about the same mass as Omega Sun, but it's only 7 million years old. And you can get that from integrated light from either colors or spectroscopy. But uh, you, in a few cases of these, they're close enough, not in the antennae, but other galaxies, we actually can get uh, preliminary CMDs to uh, justify and really drive home these very young ages as well. So these clusters, not S and Omega Sen, but of course it's not just not S, we have uh, thousands of examples of these now, young massive clusters, have similar masses and densities to that of globular clusters. And therefore what we can say is that globular clusters are in fact still forming in the local universe today. You don't need the special conditions happening in um, the early universe to form these very massive stellar populations. And that leads me to surprise number three, which is in fact a bit of an anticlimax that uh, in the past few years, due to gravitational lensing and really deep surveys, again with HST, we're actually starting to see the classic globular clusters forming at high redshift. This is an example uh, from Vanzella and collaborators uh, of a globular cluster forming at redshift 6.14. And what's surprising about this is that there's nothing surprising. It looks exactly like any young massive cluster that we observe in the antennae or anything else. There's no property that stands out in any way that just shows that this might be different. And you know, this is just one example, but in fact, we have these examples going all the way from, this is I think the highest one, redshift six, and then redshift five, four, three, two, one, all the way down to redshift zero. We don't see any distinct features in the redshift distributions. So coming back to multiple populations, it's now clear that globular clusters are not simple stellar populations that we thought. That in fact, we see uh, anomalies, chemical anomalies within, within the, the stars within the individual cluster. And you can see this when you look in photometry, in particular in UV bands. This is uh, one example here by uh, Antonino Malone, where you see a very clear uh, split of the uh, main sequence in these bands, and also splitting and spreads amongst the red giant branch stars as well. And this is also reflected if you look at uh, individual stars, you can get high resolution spectroscopy and actually measure their abundances of certain elements like sodium or oxygen, what you see is that within the same cluster, we see spreads of these elements. And they're not just unrelated, that if you're rich in sodium, you're poor in oxygen and vice versa. So in this case, you have this very nice uh, anti-correlation. So all of the ancient globular clusters that have been studied uh, in detail to date uh, all show these anomalies, but they all differ in the details. So no two clusters are actually the same. So what causes these strange color magnitude uh, diagram features? Well, if you look in the UV, what you're really seeing here is different spreads in carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. In particular, nitrogen is the heaviest one, or is the, is the, the driving feature within these. And if you look in optical filters, what you're largely seeing is spreads in helium. So a question that I always get whenever I talk about multiple populations is what about differences of age or difference in iron? And those are not driving these differences. The best limits up until uh, uh, recently was that the age difference between the populations within the ancient globular clusters was less than 300 million years. We only had an upper limit. They were uh, uh, consistent with being coeval, but they're also, um, yeah, just because at old ages, it's very hard to get accurate age dating to this type of precision. But as I come to later in the talk, we can do much better in the past couple of years. Now, Something seems to be special inside globular clusters. So here is uh, the sodium oxygen anti-correlation for stars in 47 Takane 
a, a, a massive cluster, globular cluster in the Milky Way. And what you see is that you see these, these stars spreading uh, uh, over this diagram. And if you compare that to field stars in the halo of a given metallicity, what you'd see is that almost all of the field stars rely in this region of the diagram down here. They all have very similar oxygen and sodium abundances. They'd be slightly alpha enhanced because they'd be very old. Um, and you'd see almost no uh, stars up in this region here if you're just looking at field stars. Globular clusters are almost exactly the opposite. Here you see a minority of stars being say called normal. And the majority of stars are in fact anomalous or strange. And the 3% of halo stars that live up here are thought that they have just been removed from uh, or ejected from globular clusters. So that's how we think they got there. So what's going on within globular clusters that causes the majority of stars within them to be strange, be different from the stars that we see at fixed metallicity anywhere else in the galaxy. Another strange feature of uh, the multiple populations is that the type of multiple populations that you see in clusters is actually linked to the cluster properties themselves. So this is data from the HST uh, UV survey by uh, Maloney, Piotto, and collaborators, where if you look at the fraction of enriched stars or the fraction of, of strange stars, that increases as a function of cluster mass. So the most massive clusters have the, the strong majority of the stars uh, being anomalous. But it gets even stranger because not only do you have more stars that are anomalous, the actual chemical spreads are larger inside more massive clusters. So here is the, uh, the width of the RGB in the UV. This is a proxy for uh, 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 nitrogen spreads once you remove a metallicity dependence. And again, you see a, a, a large um, correlation here. And that's particularly uh, puzzling because it means that more massive clusters have one more stars that are strange and the stars that are strange are even stranger than the stars in normal clusters. And it's gonna be very hard for any kind of scenario, any model to explain this. So what are the observables that uh, we're trying to explain? Well, we see that certain elements like helium, nitrogen, sodium, and aluminum, they go up in these so-called uh, second population or anomalous stars, the strange stars. Whereas carbon, oxygen, and magnesium, sometimes magnesium, go down. Heavy elements like iron and calcium remain largely constant. We'll hear in the next talk that there's a handful of uh, globular clusters where uh, they may show iron spreads, but that tends to be a little bit controversial, but the vast majority of them and the heavy elements remain constant. We see is that they're typically discrete sequences on the main sequence or uh, red giant branch, or even in chemical space if the data quality is high enough at all evolutionary stages from the lowest mass stars that we can observe all the way to post main sequence and uh, even the horizontal branch. And this is not a metallicity effect. We see this in metal rich clusters, meaning going, going up all the way to near solar metallicity. We also see them in the metal poor cluster going into the lowest clusters we have, Fe over H of about minus 2.5. And so for those of you that work uh, with nucleosynthesis, you might see a pattern is that this seems to be the consequence of a hot hydrogen burning. This uh, would explain a lot of the chemical patterns that we observe uh, um, within this. So only certain stars go through this hot hydrogen burning. Um, and just to say supernova can't do it. They give the wrong abundance patterns kind of across the board. So the, uh, the, the, you know, going back to the very beginnings of the field in the 80s and 90s, people just started thinking, okay, what kind of stars create these various types of abundance uh, characteristics? You have uh, high mass AGB stars, so stars between three and eight solar masses, although they tend to give a sodium oxygen correlation, so an anti-correlation, I consider that to be just a detail. The, uh, from uh, high mass rotating stars uh, or fast rotating stars, interacting massive binaries or extremely massive stars. And so basically all massive stars will do this, but you need a, a mechanism to get the nucleosynthesis that's happening in the core of these stars out to the surface. And that is why you need uh, something like this rotation or interaction, uh, uh, interacting stars. And then recently it's been put forward that you might have extremely massive stars. And what, what we're thinking about there is between stars between 5,000 and 10,000 solar masses which of course is uh, relatively crazy and should indicate to you just how uh, off the beaten path we have to go now to start, uh, to start finding the origin of this because all of the traditional ideas don't seem to be working. And so to give you a feel for uh, the types of scenarios I've been forward, I'll put forward the AGB scenario, which is the one that's been discussed most in the literature. And the other uh, scenarios are largely the same, just slightly different timescales. 
So in this scenario, you form a first generation of stars. And this is a, a simple stellar population, your classic uh, stellar cluster that you think about. All stars have the same age and uh, metallicity. And then after 30 million years, age of stars begin to evolve and they shed their material. And then it is just uh, theorized that this material will be able to cool and uh, collect in the center. Although there's a lot of reason to think that that wouldn't be happening uh, due to forward ionization and uh, winds within the cluster. But if we just take that as a given that that material would cool, now then that material still wouldn't have the right abundance. So you actually need to accrete a lot of pristine gas. And by pristine, I don't mean zero metallicity. I mean the type of uh, material that formed this first generation, the exact the basic remnants of the molecular cloud would have to come back and uh, get dumped onto the cluster at just the right time. It is then that you would form a second generation of uh, stars in the cluster center. But if you actually work out the numbers, what you find out is that the mass available to do this, even if you start playing with the IMF, is in fact only a small fraction of what you need. So then the final step is you'd have to lose about 95% of the first uh, generation as well. And so you can see is that there's a lot of tweaks to get this model even anywhere near what observations and say there's no real physical reason why you'd expect to see such rapid mass loss uh, after you formed a stable cluster that existed for 30 to 100 million years. You can test that. So the first thing you can do is, well, if you have multiple generations of star formation going within your clusters, we should see that. We should see this in these young globular clusters in the antenna galaxies or others. So we've gone out and looked at it. We have about 140 clusters with uh, spectra where we're looking for basically the evidence for an underlying old population, then ongoing star formation within them. And no uh, cluster has ever been found to date that has that uh, uh, any evidence of a second generation of stars forming it, even through star formation histories. And some of the deepest ALMA observations that have ever been taken were used to search the antennae. These three particular clusters that I'm showing here circled in uh, green, because of course, if you're going to form a second generation, you should have a huge reservoir of gas and dust within it as well. And uh, that no gas or dust was found within these clusters. And Steve Longmore showed that in fact, if you have the amount of gas and dust that you would need to form these second generation stars, that you would actually see this directly on the HST images. You see a basically a hole of extinction right in the center of these clusters, which has also never been seen. But these are all integrated light studies. And, uh, you know, and we can get a really nice constraints, but what we really want is to study young or at least younger clusters, but actually resolve them on a star by star basis. And that we're very lucky because our two of our nearest neighbors, you can see here the large and small Magellanic clouds are dwarf galaxies that have actually been ongoing star formation, relatively high rate for the past 12 gig years at more or less a constant rate, uh, give or take a factor of a few, which means that they have stellar clusters of all ages. And this is just a few of them where we can find stellar clusters that we can resolve into individual stars uh, going from three, uh, two or three mega years here in the center of R130 uh, Doradus, R136, to 100, 300, a few gig years, all the way up to the classic ancient globular clusters of 11 gig years. So we can study these types of clusters at a variety of, age, uh, of ages, all within a relatively small, narrow uh, mass range in order to try to remove the uh, dependence on mass, cluster mass on the, the manifestation of multiple populations to see where and when we might find multiple populations. And uh, this has been carried out uh, by in, in a number of papers over the past uh, four or five years. This is just one example. This is Lindsay one in the SMC. It's a seven and a half uh, gig year old cluster, which means it formed a redshift of one. If you look in a, a nice combination of filters in the UV, you can see that the red giant branch splits very nicely into two. If you took a cut across that, that's what the histogram is showing. It's clearly bimodal. It's a very nice example, just like in the ancient globular clusters where you see a bimodal distribution uh, due to chemical spreads. Then they went out, uh, uh, Hollyhead and collaborators, and actually measured a, a nitrogen spread within these stars. So this seems to be a manifestation of multiple populations. So it's not just limited to the ancient globular clusters. It's not a uh, a cosmological effect, uh, we see it actually all the way down to about two gig years or so. So multiple populations are there. And what this does, so the, the uh, is allows us to get new constraints on the problem. So the youngest cluster where multiple populations have been found uh, to date is NGC 1978. This is a two billion year old cluster in the LMC. And what this can do is that we can put really 
tight constraints on age differences between the populations. The reason for that is at this age, the vertical position of the subgiant branch is extremely sensitive to age and virtually insensitive to any abundance differences. And so, but if you go to UV filters, it turns out the opposite. There's almost no age sensitivity, but it's almost all entirely driven by different nitrogen abundances. So what uh, Silvia Martokia and collaborators were able to do is uh, look at the, uh, to separate out the populations based on UV photometry, put them back into an optical CMD. And what you expect to see is that one population should lie above the other population. And what they found is in fact, that they were totally, they were totally on top of each other, completely consistent with having the same age. So if you do a full Bayesian analysis, what they found is that the age difference was, was one plus or minus 20 million years. So this is about a factor of 10 better than what we can do in the ancient globular clusters, because this cluster itself is about a factor of 10 younger than the ancient globular cluster. So it's just a manifestation of that. And that's just one uh, case, but Sarah Saracino and collaborators did this for another cluster, NGC 2121, and found that essentially the same result, the age difference of six million years plus or minus 12. And right away, you can see this rules out the age B scenario uh, because they need at least 30 million years to, to get that scenario to work. But in fact, I would argue that this is largely inconsistent with most of the scenarios or all the scenarios put forward, really. And so what we're dealing with is not multiple generations of stars within these clusters. In fact, these are coeval populations. And so we're in saying that we're kind of back to square one to try to explain where these things are coming from. So if we look at all the clusters that have been studied in the Magellanic clouds, we can end up with a diagram like this. So age is on the x-axis. On the y-axis, again, it's the width of the RGB in some filter combination. That's going to be a proxy for nitrogen spreads. And what we can see here is that uh, there seems to be a dependent on age, but uh, just with the caveat that the clusters up here also tend to be more massive. And uh, because they're more massive, we know there's dependence on mass in the multiple populations. So we can't be sure without getting more data points that this is mass driven. But just say that these clusters and these clusters seem to have very similar masses. And they, um, we do not find multiple populations any, in any cluster younger than two gig years. Now, all of these results are based on the RGB, just because the LMC and SNC are relatively far away. That's all we have access to, even with the Hubble Space Telescope. For most that we, we were trying to get down to the main sequence and there's gonna be some nice results coming in the next year or so on that, I hope. But for now, we're gonna concentrate on the RGB. And so if you just focus on one single uh, stellar evolutionary phase, what we see is that we see decreasing stellar mass on the RGB as we move to the right. And there seems to be a limit then if we, instead of an, if we don't take this as an age limit, but as a stellar mass limit, and this is an RGB mass of about one and a half solar masses. And there is something uh, for those aficionados here, and I guess many people probably in the audience know right away, this is gonna ring a lot of bells, is that this is the regime where you're gonna go from, uh, uh, where all of a sudden the magnetic fields are gonna be developing within your stars. Can, the stars can go undergo magnetic breaking. So stars that are, uh, it evolved to the RGB that are younger than this or, or higher mass RGB stars are gonna continue rotating their whole main sequence life all the way up until they get to the subgiant branch and slow down just to annual oh, yes. momentum. Where stars on the uh, right side of this are gonna be uh, braked. So they might be born as rapid rotators, but they're gonna be rapidly braked over tens or hundreds of million years. Yep, thank you. And uh, perhaps that is uh, some indication now, it also could be that these are hosting multiple populations and just our techniques of identifying them are not uh, good enough at the moment. So that's an open question, but I think it's, uh, it's worthwhile noting that right as we see rotation disappearing in clusters, stellar rotation disappearing in clusters is right at the same time that we see uh, multiple populations kicking in. And so this just summarizes where we got from the Magellanic Cloud, as I say, all clusters that are high mass above two gig years on the RGB seem to show this. Uh, all globular clusters are, seem to show it. Open clusters here do not show it. One cluster in the uh, LMC that's low mass does not seem to show it. If we then move to integrated light studies, we see that uh, none of these young clusters seem to show it. These are less sensitive, but this is the best you can do if the, if the cluster is gonna be uh, you know, many megaparsecs away. But we also have integrated, oh, the, sorry, this is highest mass open cluster that's been studied that does not host multiple populations. If we look at integrated light, we get the same result, that younger clusters don't show it 
and older clusters do. So I think there's something to this limit at two gig years of where this might uh, be coming from. And so just to summarize what I've said, so globular clusters are not simple stellar populations. They host abundant spreads within them, which are known as multiple populations. Globular clusters are still forming today. These are known as young massive clusters or young globular clusters. And because of their young ages, they provide some of the best constraints on models to date. Both populations are not restricted to the ancient uh, ages, but uh, they, we see it all clusters above ages, all massive clusters above two gig years or so. It's not multiple generations, but the populations within clusters seem to be coeval with the best age limits about less than 15 million years. And none of the suggestion models work. And that's one of the reasons I wanna be here today is hopefully get new people here thinking about the problem uh, in, in new uh, ways that maybe uh, drive us uh, the field further. And then just to graphically show this, this is a, a, a table from an annual review that uh, we wrote a couple of years ago. But these are some of the four major scenarios that have been put forward in literature, AGBs, fast forward to massive stars, very massive stars or early disaccretion. Just say, I was the one that put forward this and this is just as wrong as all the rest. Uh, these are just some of the constraints that we have observationally. These two passed that, but only because they were developed after these constraints were known. So it's a bit cheating. And uh, just to say, none of the models are doing particularly well. And I can bring up other things. We could talk about this for uh, you know, many, many hours, but why all these constraints are not met. And so just to have some concluding rem remarks to hopefully stimulate some of you to start thinking about the problem is I will argue that observational studies are running out of steam a bit. I don't expect to see too many surprises from JDB or, or uh, JST, JWST or ELT. And the reason for that is right now, the field is theory limited that without a model, it's not really clear which direction we should push, which elements should we be looking at, which are the, what are the important uh, parameters that we should be studying, should we uh, more or less be butterfly collecting, looking at individual clusters in a lot of detail, or should we be trying to expand parameter space at the risk of uh, less sensitivity? My current guess is that it's something somehow related to magnetic breaking and stellar rotation, but of course I need to note that there's no reason Theoretically, that that should, be, that should be the case. There's no model that would predict any of these abundance trends happening at that age or that mass limit. This is just basically what the observations seem to be pointing to at the, at the moment. And finally, again, just to emphasize that we need new ideas and hopefully I've gotten you thinking uh, about this uh, new problem for you. Thank you. Thank you, Nate. Uh, we can now take um, uh, some questions. So uh, on the Slack, uh, um, I've seen a question by um, Diego Goda uh, Rivera. Going back to the five-step process to explain the multiple populations, what mechanism could eject the first generation stars but keep the second? Or are they supposed to be ejected right before the second generation forms? Thanks. Yeah, it's an excellent question. And so uh, what's been proposed is that if the second generation is, is formed more centrally concentrated, that the, um, the, the first generation, the more extended population, will be more um, affected by tides, okay? And that's the simple answer. But in reality, that doesn't work. And the reason for that is that these um, clusters that you need to remove all these stars are the highest mass clusters. And the highest mass clusters should actually lose the smallest fractions of their stars. It's harder to remove a star from a high mass cluster than it is from a low mass cluster. And so, you know, it's, it's basically just toy models that if you start with a cluster that's fully tidally limited from the moment that uh, the second generation forms, so the first, so the second generation is not tidally limited, but the first generation is, then you're going to start stripping off the first generation stars. And, you know, while that, you know, sounds good in, in principle, anyway, in practice, I don't think it actually works. And so just to say, yeah, you actually need the first generation of stars to stick around until you collected all of their material so that you can't lose them before the, uh, the second generation forms. It has to be after. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, there are some comments uh, with, by Corinne Charbonnel, but I will let you discuss with her in the chat or uh, let me ask uh, questions first. Uh, from Noah Tosho, could multiple population in globular clusters be caused by past merger with older or other clusters? 
Yeah. So that is one of the, you know, the first scenario that was thought about. And so I think it's, it's, it's the one that keep coming back. And the simple answer is no, because if that was the case, well, we should, we should find some clusters that are only populating this region here and other clusters that only have this region here. Therefore, the merger of them would provide this, uh, this trend. And you don't, right? You're, every time you look, you always see this trend. So they all have to be uh, part of you know, a very rare merger. And also to point out that the, you, the, uh, iron, the constancy in iron and calcium between the different populations rules out that this is you know, really two separate events. Uh, they're just too similar to, uh, to happen for the majority of cases. Thank you. There is a question in the chat uh, of the Zoom uh, by Ayush Moharana. How do you uh, characterize a globular cluster at high redshifts? So um, this, uh, so I don't. <laughs> this is really pushing the exact limit of what we can do. And uh, this is something where uh, Eris Vanzella has really led the charge. He does amazing stuff. And so what, what it is, it's basically a size restriction, is that these things are so magnified behind uh, a lens that you actually can uh, get a limit on their size, their effective radius. And in this case, the upper limit was something like 12 parsecs. And it is re absolutely remarkable. And the other group that are doing this uh, a lot is uh, Richard Bowen's group. And by and large, the constraints that they're getting on these is they, they see galaxies that have, you know, uh, sizes of 50 to 150 parsecs, but then they see this population of very uh, dense things that have sizes of, of uh, 10 parsecs, roughly, or so. And this is how you can identify a globular cluster and separate it out from, um, from a galaxy, for example. So last question before we go to the next speaker. Uh, by Francesca D'Antona. In search of new ideas, why a nitrogen difference by a factor of uh, 0.1 in the log abundance should be due to the same mechanism as a factor 1 or 1.3? Well, um, I think that uh, the, the nitrogen differences, in fact, in some of the young clusters are not 0.1. They're actually about 0.8 or so. So they're actually pretty similar. Then you have to throw in the effect of uh, cl globular cluster mass, that higher mass clusters have larger spreads. And the clusters that we left were limited to clusters with a higher mass of just a couple times 10 to the five. So we can't access the ones that are 10 to the six and above that really show these very large uh, nitrogen spreads. So I think actually they, they are quite comparable. And finally, for the youngest clusters uh, in, the, in the sample that we do find multiple populations, so ages of two to three gig years, we have another effect that they're actually affected by the dredge up. So the amount of nitrogen spread that we see is actually a lower limit because the, the dredge up actually makes the two populations, um, if you're gonna measure the nitrogen budgets, converge. And so it's a, it's a lower limit just due to the, the first dredge up as the stars go through uh, the subgiant branch and early red giant branch. Okay, thank you, Nate, for a great talk. Uh, I advise you to go on the Slack uh, where there are some uh, comments by Corinne uh, in particular, the last slide, she seemed to disagree, so I let you answer her. <laughs> and yes. uh, uh, I will now go uh, with uh, Anna Fabiola Marino uh, to uh, chemical abundance variation among stellar population in globular clusters. I will warn you uh, after nine minutes uh, like this, you, you, you have time for questions. Thank you. I can't hear you. We don't hear you yet. Can okay. you? Can you uh, yes, it's good. Okay. 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 First of all, thank you to give me the possibility to take you to a journey uh, through the multiple stellar populations. But uh, in my talk. I will focus on uh, a kind of multiple stellar population, so a particular class of clusters that I call anomalous or type two globular clusters. Uh, well, let me start with this uh, diagram. This is a photometric diagram that we call the chromosome map. And it is actually the most powerful tool we have to analyze the multiple stellar populations phenomenon. 
This is a photometric diagram that is based on HST filters, and basically it is able to distinguish st stellar populations with the different chemical abundances. So we can have a first population here and the second population here. And this is due to the fact that we see uh, in the ultraviolet we have the interplay of different molecules, for example, OH and NH, CN, and so on. Uh, I think in my, that in, in my opinion, one of the most intriguing findings from the analysis of these powerful photometric diagrams is the fact that in the Milky Way, we can distinguish two different classes of globular clusters. We have the type one cluster that have a chromosome map like this one shown here. So you can distinguish different stellar populations. Here we can distinguish at least five populations. And these are the most common globular clusters in our Milky Way. But on the other hand, we have another class of objects that we call the type two globular clusters that have a completely different chromosome map morphology, as you can see in all these maps. We have a typical chromosome map sequence here shown in gray uh, colors, but additionally to that, we have a redder sequence. So we have red uh, chromosome maps here that are not present in typical globular clusters. So what's going on here? I have to say that before the introduction of the chromosome map diagram that occurred in 2015, we already knew about some clusters with heavy elements variations. And this is an important point because heavy element variations were considered the trait of more massive systems, not of globular clusters. So for example, of dwarf galaxies. But we have some clusters and maybe M22 is one of the of the most famous cases in which we have variations in heavy elements. We have, for example, uh, here an S-rich and an S-poor group of stars with the S-rich stars having also higher iron abundances. Uh, in 2015, when the chromosome maps were introduced, we could link the two phenomena, so the chemical abundance uh, variations in heavy elements and the chromosome map, because we could recognize the presence of these stars and us in metallicity and in S elements here on the red side of the chromosome map. So basically, the type 2 chromosome map morphology is characterized by the presence of stars that are enhanced in certain heavy elements. Uh, sorry. Uh, could you hear me? Anti, io non sento più niente. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, yes, yes, sorry. Yes, I have, uh, let me... Uh, You're just out of the uh, slideshow. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, Omega Centauri is one of the most famous type two globular clusters. Well, this is because it's high variations in heavy elements, but also because, as you can see here, the chromosome map is very well extended towards the red side. It is a good proxy of the fact that we have metallicity variations that could be recognized on the chromosome map because the x-axis of the chromosome map is tightly correlated with iron. And so this is an indication of the fact that we can find uh, globular clusters with the metallicity variations simply looking at the chromosome map. But which is the, the uh, why these clusters are, are so different? Well, first of all, if you look at their mass, they are distributed in the higher mass tail of the distribution of Milky Way globular clusters, are these red objects here. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the chemical abundances in this context were uh, determined only for the more massive clusters, uh, so we did not have uh, until recently information about the low mass tail of this uh, type 2 globular clusters. But recently we have filled this gap and we have analyzed the two less massive clusters uh, in this uh, type 2 group. Indeed, NGC 1261 and NGC 1634. 
These are the chromosome maps that uh, we have analyzed. Uh, in particular, we got high resolution spectra of stars uh, that are distributed on the two chromosome map sequences of the two clusters, uh, as indicated in this plot. And this is the distribution of the stars also on a classical color magnitude diagram. This is a summary of the results. Well, here I show you all the elements that we have analyzed from oxygen to europium, but I would like you to concentrate on, on this region of the, the plot, because here I show you the neutron capture elements. You see that the, the blue stars on the chromosome map and the red stars show basically the same, exactly the same uh, chemical abundances within observational error. And this is a very different from what was previously uh, found for the other type two globular clusters, including Omega Centauri. This is another plot that, sh that show you the same result. But here you can see that similarly to the other uh, type two globular clusters, also these two clusters have variations in metallicity. And the right in the same di directions that is observed in the other type two clusters. So red stars are basically metal rich, but we do not have any variation in lantanum, which is uh, an S process element. So, uh, the mass uh, of the cluster so should, uh, should have an important role in this game. Uh, this is because uh, these are uh, the two less massive clusters in the type two group. Uh, and uh, they, and uh, well, uh, to, to summarize you the results that we have for this class of clusters, uh, I show you here two plots. In the first plot, uh, I show you the fraction of the supernovae, uh, core collapse supernovae material that is locked in the red population stars. You can see that in general, uh, this material is, uh, is uh, small, it's, uh, it, it isn't larger than the 2%. But in some clusters that are the most massive one, here is the, the present day mass. Well, here we have a higher, variation, a higher uh, fraction of this material in the red population. So it looks like more massive clusters have been able to retain a larger amount of material from supernovae type. And this is also seen by looking at the additional iron in the red population as a function of mass for type two clusters. So you see that there is a good correlation. And what is intriguing and what we have found now is that these two clusters, the less massive type two clusters are the only two type two globular clusters that do not show a cell element enrichment. So our question is if there is a threshold in the globular, mass, uh, globular cluster mass that can support the enrichment in the S elements. Well, this is um, a list of globular clusters uh, in which heavy elements uh, and uh, iron uh, and S elements have been studied. Of course, this is a list that will be enriched, uh, I hope, with, uh, with the new objects. But consider that already now, by the uh, with the analysis of type two globular clusters, the 18% of the analyzed clusters are type two. This means that the 18% of globular clusters in the Milky Way have variations in the heavy elements. So uh, I would like to contradict what uh, Nate said in his talk, because uh, this is not a handful a number of clusters. This is an important fraction of clusters in the Milky Way, so almost the 20%. So this phenomenon really uh, needs to be understood. Three minutes. Yes. Uh, now, in the last three minutes, I would like to talk to you about a new phenomenon mm -hmm. that we have recently discovered. Uh, we have found that maybe the metallicity variations are a more widespread phenomenon, not confined to the type two globular clusters, but possibly presence, present also in type one clusters, in particular in those clusters that have a large uh, spread in the x-axis, which can be interpreted as helium. But if it is helium, we would find also other uh, variations in other elements, for example, sodium, oxygen, or aluminum, or magnesium, that from our high resolution study, we did not find. Because here you see that the, the stars that we have analyzed, uh, that are in dark green in these two plots, well, they all have uh, chemical abundances consistent with the first population. 
binaries. Well, our simulation suggests that binaries uh, um, uh, occupy the lower values of the x-axis on the chromosome map. So binaries could be good candidate to explain the elongation, but the simulations do not uh, reproduce the observations because they cannot account for the large number of observed stars in the lower part, uh, in the lower values, uh, at the lower values of the x-axis of the chromosome map. So maybe a combination of binaries and metallicity. And this is a plot that show you the situation. Well, here we have lantanum, which is an S element, as a function of the dispersion in the radial velocity. The shaded area here is populated by the binary candidates. If you look at the position of the binary candidates on the chromosome map, so on the x-axis, you see that these are the, the ones with the lowest values in the x-axis. But if you look at this color bar here, which is indicative of, of the iron content, well, you see that also the stars that have lower iron abundances have lower X values on, on the chromosome map. So maybe a combination of small metallicity variations and binarity could explain this, uh, this, uh, this intriguing phenomenon. But this is still an open, an open issue. I would like to leave you with my conclusions. Well, uh, as Nate said, we have uh, today a rather incoherent picture of how multiple populations formed. Uh, it is a very heterogeneous world, uh, world and uh, mass, uh, the mass of the cluster, I believe, that has an important, uh, uh, an important role. In particular, for the anomalous type 2 globular clusters that I have discussed, because these clusters are the most massive in our galaxy, and also within this class of clusters, so also within the type two globular clusters, we have some differences depending on the mass of the object, because the less massive object do not show evidence of S-process enrichment, for example. The most massive object have higher values of iron variations and so on. And finally, uh, the chemical uh, uh, heterogeneity in a metallicity could be a more spread phenomenon, as I have shown you for uh, the type 1 globular clusters in the last slide. However, this uh, could also be due to, um, uh, da, um, due to, the, to, to heterogeneity in the molecular clouds from which globular clusters form the type redshift. Of course, it is important to understand all, the, all these issues, uh, to understand the early phases of the chemical evolution of galaxies, not just the origin of the multiple stellar population phenomenon. And uh, yes, with this I conclude, and uh, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. So um, I have a, a web question. I don't see much question in the this, in this, in this Slack. Um, so uh, I have a question about the, the binarity uh, that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. I wanted to, to, to know if you have evidence uh, that there are more binaries in globular clusters than uh, in, uh, we say, open clusters or in more general uh, halo stars, you see? Well, in globular clusters, uh, what we have uh, is a study of uh, the fraction of binaries in many globular clusters from, from uh, photometry uh, that is based on main sequence stars. And uh, usually the fraction of binaries uh, is uh, low. Indeed, uh, in uh, the simulation that I have shown you here, uh, well, the simulation is based actually on the observed binary fraction on uh, the main sequence stars, which is roughly the 12 or 30%. Um, so yes, we have uh, studies on uh, binarity, but uh, these studies are confined to the main sequence or to uh, RGB. In the case of RGB, however, they are based mostly, yes, on radial velocities and um, and yes, uh, for example, in our sample, uh, we found uh, by radial velocities uh, that we have uh, two uh, stars that are likely binaries because of the radial velocity spread is uh, quite high. In any case, uh, yes, the fraction that we know, the fra binary fractions that we know in globular clusters is relatively small. Okay, thank you very much. So now I'm going to go to the next talk. Um, which is by Giacomo Cordoni, Internal Dynamics of Multiple Star Population in Globular Clusters. 
So I will uh, tell you after nine minutes uh, that uh, uh, to, like this, you, you, you can conclude and have time for questions. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Hi, everyone. Can you see my screen and you hear me? In, but you are not in uh, the most, yeah. Perfect. You can go. Okay. Great. Hi, everyone. I'm Giacomo Cordoni, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Padova. And today I will, I will talk to you about the research that I've been doing over the past years, and that involves the study of the internal dynamics of multiple stellar population in global air clusters. So in the last two talks, we've already heard uh, quite a few things about uh, global air clusters in general and about multiple stellar populations. So I'm not gonna spend uh, too much time introducing the argument. However, I just want to stress some few, a few things before uh, talking to my uh, talking about my actual work. So, uh, as Nate said, uh, multiple population are an ubiquitous phenomenon in global clusters, in the sense that we observe them in nearly all galactic global clusters. However, the uh, way they present themselves varies a lot from cluster to clusters. And for instance, we have uh, apparently very simple cases like NGC 6838 shown here where you can see that on the, chroma, on the di color mark to diagram, there are only two sequences, or in other words, there are only two stellar populations. But at the same time, we also have uh, more complex cases like NGC 2808, where the, call, the CMD is very uh, complicated, and we know that there are at least five different stellar populations. But we also have some extremely complicated cases, like the uh, very famous Omega Centauri already uh, cited by Fabiola, where we know that there are a uh, very large number of stellar populations, even though to say the actual number is very complicated. So I guess that the complexity of this phenomenon is already clear by looking at these three CMDs, but that becomes even clearer when we look at the chromosome map. That is probably the best tool to, first of all, identify and then to study multiple stellar populations. So, for instance, if we look at the simplest case, simplest case uh, we have that uh, different stellar population define two uh, very separate groups of stars, so that makes it relatively easy to identify them. However, the case of Omega Centauri, it's uh, kind of a mess, and it's very difficult to uh, identify different groups of stars. So, um, the multiplication phenomenon, as uh, it's already been said, is very complicated. But uh, thanks to the chromosome map and to uh, detailed spectroscopical study, today we have been able to identify, let's say, two kinds of classes that are uh, type one clusters and type two globular clusters. So as said by Fabiola, uh, type one globular clusters are characterized by a spread in light element uh, uh, abundances among uh, uh, multiple cell population. On the end, type two globular clusters have uh, both light and heavy element uh, variations like iron in the case of uh, Omega Centauri. So the point that I'm trying to make, uh, and that I guess it's already clear, is that uh, the multipopulation phenomenon is very complex. And because of this, we are still uh, struggling to understand how this population form. And uh, very briefly, because we, we've already heard about these, uh, these scenarios, we have today two scenarios, the multi-generation scenarios where stars are born in different star formation episodes with the second generation of stars born out of the ejecta of first generation more massive stars with uh, the number of these polluters being uh, still highly debated. On the other end, we have single generation scenario where stars belong to the same stellar generations and some stars then changes their chemical composition, let's say on the fly due to some exotic physical processes. So to understand how, which, which is the correct model. So far, we have mostly focused our efforts on photometry and those spectroscopy, so that today we have fairly well characterized the, the properties of multiple stellar population. We know the abundance patterns like the uh, sodium and oxygen anticorrelation. We, do, we know the population ratios and their relation with mass. But this is not enough, and we still don't know how this, this population formed. So we need new ideas. But, uh, is there any other way that we can tackle this phenomenon? Well, actually there is, 
And uh, specifically in the recent years, there have been uh, uh, different theoretical and numerical studies that show that uh, the present day dynamics uh, of multiple star population in globular clusters is linked to the initial configuration of the different population. Or in, in uh, simpler terms, if we have the two population are born in a different uh, environment or with a dif different configuration, then they will develop with a different dynamics. And those differences can still be observable in the present day dynamics. So after 10 to 13 billion years. And uh, by studying and by looking for these differences, we can gain a lot of insights uh, into the formation, into the early phases of the, uh, the globular clusters. But what do we need to perform uh, this kind of studies? But first of all, we want to have a very accurate proper motion me measurements in the sense that we want to be able to detect even the smallest possible differences between the motions of the stars belonging to different stellar populations. And at the same time, we want to be able to study uh, the whole cluster field. So we want to have a wide field of view in order to follow the velocity profile uh, up to the uh, outer region of the clusters. And finally, we, we want to, we want what probably any observational astronomer wants, we want to have a very large number of stars in order to not be biased by uh, low statistics. So the, the real question is, can we match these requirements or are they too much? Well, Actually, we can, and uh, in particular, thanks to Gaia DR2 and now Gaia IDR3, we have a very accurate proper motion for a huge number of stars so that we can study the dynamics of uh, stars belonging to globular clusters over the whole cluster field. And what I did in my work is I combined three different data sets that are HST photometry and uh, astrometry to study the innermost region of the clusters together with uh, uh, Gaia DR2 and ground-based photometry to study the outermost region of the clusters. And uh, so we analyzed a sample of nine galactic globular clusters composed of the seven type one globular clusters and two type two globular clusters that are uh, Omega Centauri and M22. So I don't have the time to talk about all the results. So I just chose one cluster and I'm gonna focus on that one. Of course, that cluster is Omega Centauri. So. Uh, as we said, Omega Centauri is a type two globular cluster. So it uh, hosts stars with a different iron abundance. So what we did, we exploited um, the CMD in order to select stars based on their iron content. And we analyzed their morphology and their internal dynamics. So concerning the morphology, uh, you can see that uh, the two main stellar populations uh, share the same, uh, in the same morphology indeed the uh, they are the same within the uh, observational uncertainties. And the same goes for their velocity profile that you can see here, their dispersion profile and their rotation. So the punchline is that uh, if we take iron as a discriminant between the stellar populations, we find that uh, they share the same dynamics and the same morphology. So they are uh, roughly equivalent. But as we said, type two globular clusters also have a spread in light element abundances like nitrogen. So what about those stellar population? Are they the same dynamically and morphologically? Well, to answer this question, we exploited again the chromosome map. And you can see are the uh, nitrogen rich stars and nitrogen poor stars selected as streams. And we repeated the analysis just like in the case of iron. And what we get is very different. Uh, for instance, if you look at their morphology of nitrogen poor and nitrogen rich stars, we see that uh, uh, the blue ellipses are much more flattened and uh, indeed the, uh, the, the, the two populations have a, a different mix, a different morphology, sorry. And uh, if we look at their dynamics, we see that uh, uh, concerning the rotational profile that is the bottom panel, the red points are uh, follow a different pattern than the blue points, uh, meaning that they have a different rotational profile. And if we focus on the region where we see the most differences uh, that is labeled R1 here, we see that the rotational pattern is clearly different and is different beyond the observational uncertainty. So that makes it, uh, that makes this uh, uh, difference significant. So uh, what we did then is that we combined the selection in uh, iron and in nitrogen 
and we study the dynamics of all these subpopulations. And what we find is that uh, uh, when we account for difference in nitrogen, we see some differences. While when we look at population with different iron, we don't see any differences, nor in the morphology, nor in the dynamics. So what could that mean? Well, first of all, uh, one uh, uh, result, one consequence is that uh, the enrichment, uh, uh, the process that led to the enrichment in iron is different from the process that led to the enrichment in nitrogen. So these two processes are independent from one another. And uh, uh, by, let's say, performing this kind of study, we can uh, gain a lot of clues into the origin of multiple stellar populations. And uh, analyzing the sample of nine clusters, we found uh, some uh, clear kinematical differences in uh, some of those clusters. And I think that the most interesting case is uh, M5, where we find uh, a clear uh, difference in rotation. And uh, uh, interesting, interestingly, when we see a dynamical difference, we also see a morphological difference. So the two population uh, either share both the same dynamic and the same morphology, or uh, they don't share them at all. So this is related to the, uh, let's say, the outside the, the relaxation time of the clusters and the, how the clusters evolve and wash away uh, the initial differences. But uh, uh, when I leave you here with my conclusion, and if you uh, are interested in knowing more about uh, the whole the nine cluster analyzed, uh, the two papers are already published, or you can uh, check up for the webpage, my, my personal webpage, or for the Galpor webpage. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we have time for uh, some questions. I don't see questions on the uh, on the Slack or no. Uh, people are a bit quiet here. Um, so I have uh, one question. I would like to to come back to your rotation curve. I found that quite interesting uh, that uh, you may have a different uh, distribution of rotation uh, in in your in your stars. Can you go back to the uh, this one or the, yeah the previous I don't, yeah and yeah the one before yes this one yes so i would like uh, uh, and no come back this one sorry i think there's a slight delay uh, yeah, yeah so one with the radius you know oh so, yes uh, I'm, uh, okay so this one maybe slide 12. Yeah, this one. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I wanted to understand a bit better. So here, what you are finding is that uh, this uh, composition in some uh, could be modified uh, by uh, the uh, rotation. Um, so can you can you tell me a little bit more? I'm not too used of this uh, right, with this plot. So are the red triangles in the bottom plot uh, meaning that the, the stars are rotating faster? Yeah. Uh, the, this, the, the bottom panel shows the rotational profile, so uh, in, as a function of the distance from the cluster center. So the theoretical models uh, suggest that uh, a rotational profile of the cluster should like peak uh, toward the, I don't know, the inner or middle region and then decrease. And uh, what we find is while the M poor population is following this uh, clear profile with a peak for 1.5 alpha light radii. The blue one, the, so enriched stars are rotating slower in the inner region. And uh, we analyzed the differences uh, alone, let's say. So we focused only on that region when we see the difference. And we found that uh, the significance of the rotational difference is uh, beyond observational uncertainties. So this means that the two population are rotating with a different, uh, let's say, pattern with a different mm -hmm. profile. Do you, and think it can come, sorry? Sorry. Do you think it can come from the, the wind of the stars and the fact that uh, depending on their composition, they may be more or less break? Uh, well, actually, what the, the, the model suggests is that in order to have a different uh, rotational profile, because it's uh, uh, the rotation around the cluster center, uh, not of the, it's not the rotation of the star itself, but rotation okay. around the center. So it's a uh, motion. In order uh, to have some differences, the dynamics, it means that the population should have been born uh, with 
a, let's say, a different configuration, like uh, the second generation could be uh, in a disk or more concentrated or uh, I don't know uh, what else. But uh, in order to explain a kinematical differences, we need to assume some uh, differences. I mean, to my knowledge, there are no other uh, accretion phenomena that, that could uh, modify the, the, the internal dynamics of the whole population uh, in this term. Okay, thank you very much. So now it's time for the accus. So uh, ah, there was a question, sorry, by Becky Arnold. How could kinematic difference survive for so many crossing time? And is there any possibilities that the kinematic differences could have developed rather than being primordial? Well, uh, I'm not sure there is any process that can uh, like change the dynamics during the, the life of a globular clusters. So what can happen is the, the opposite way so that you have a difference in dynamics and then it gets washed away during the evolution of the clusters. But I don't know how uh, the, the motion of the whole population could be modified, modified by some, uh, uh, I don't know, by, by, by some physical process. So- okay. uh, <laughs> Thank you. So Scott, go ahead, sorry. Hi, my name is Katja Poppenhager, and I would like you to know if you care about exoplanet atmospheres, and especially if you care about infrared helium observations of atmospheres, then you really also need to care about stellar coronal abundances. And the reason for that is that it's the stellar coronal iron lines that are in a large part responsible for putting the helium in the exoplanet atmosphere into the correct excitation state to be observable. So if you want your helium observations to be a success, pick a star with strong coronal iron lines. And for more, check out my poster. Hello, my name is Joe Callingham. I'm gonna to talk to you about radio stars and exoplanets at low frequencies. What can a low frequency detection of a stellar system tell us? Well, it can give us a direct measurement of the magnetic field strength of the potential radio emitting star or exoplanet as modeled off the Jupiter Io system, where Io is driving these beautiful aurorae on Jupiter. We've used the Dutch radio telescope called LOFAR to try and find these systems outside our, our, our solar system because it's so sensitive. And this is our first detection of GJ1151, an MDORF system, which you can see appear on the left and disappear on the right between two, two different epochs. After modeling the radio emission, we found the best model that could fit is a scaled up Jupiter IO system where we replace Jupiter with the star and IO with the potential putative uh, exoplanet uh, of about an Earth size in a one to five day orbit. And uh, interestingly, the Habitable Planet Finding Team recently detected an RV signal from this star of a roughly Earth-sized planet in a two-day orbit. And so to conclude, we think we're seeing the first detections of star-planet interactions at low frequencies. Hi, I'm Adam Germain, and I want to tell you about tides, differential rotation, and eclipsing binaries. We know from helioseismic observations that stars can have persistent, large-scale differential rotation. This differential rotation means that when a binary tidally synchronizes, it isn't the surface that synchronizes to the orbital period, but somewhere deeper in the star. And so the surface period may not equal the orbital period. We think this may have been seen in a population of solar-like Kepler eclipsing binaries. And we combined these observations together with tidal theory to infer constraints on the differential rotation of sun-like stars. What we see is that these stars have much less shear than the sun which we think is because they're on average much more rapid rotators. Um, for more, please see our paper, Jermaine, Tyre, and Fuller, 2020. The archive number is on the slide. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. I'm Morgan Deal. I would like to present our recent work on lithium abundant dispersion in metal poor stars. Many population two stars show similar lithium abundance, the so-called lithium plateau. But many metal poor stars also present a large scatter. In this work, we focused on carbon enhanced metal poor stars. These stars are believed to be formed by the accretion of the wind of a companion going through the AGB phase. We computed population 2 solar models with the Montreal Montpellier evolution code, including this effect of accretion. We included atomic diffusion and we especially studied the impact of thermoaline convection triggered by the unstable mean molecular weight gradient constructed by accretion using a recent prescription. This instability is known to induce lithium depletion. We show that lithium dispersion can be explained by the accretion of matter starting from an initial primordial lithium. If you want more details, please check our poster. Thank you for your attention.
In Morella Naylor 2019, we introduce a new technique for measuring a star's radius using only geometric distances and multiband photometry. The shape of the spectral energy distribution determines the SED temperature and the flux beneath it, the luminosity. We produced a catalogue of radius measurements for over 15,000 low mass stars. From this, we were able to derive the temperature radius and luminosity radius relationships for main sequence M dwarfs. Our work then investigated the apparent 3-7% spread in radius for main sequence M dwarfs. The conclusion of these studies was that stellar magnetism was not the cause of radius inflation on the main sequence, with the spread instead being caused by fitting a distribution of metallicities with only solar metallicity models. However, our method is able to measure luminosity regardless of this, enabling us to mitigate against this with precise measurements of metallicity. Removing this spread, we find that M dwarfs sit on a tight sequence with a 1-2% intrinsic spread. See these results in detail in our publications. Hey everyone, my name is Oliver Hall, and my haiku is Rotation slows less on late main sequence than thought, seen through vibrations. Stars on the main sequence lose angular momentum as they age, and the rate at which they lose angular momentum is tied to their colour. So if you know a star's colour and its rotation rate, you know its age. However, this so-called gyrochronology relation seems to break down past the middle of the main sequence age. Um, this has been seen using rotation rates from spots in field stars. We have confirmed this so-called weak magnetic breaking effect using new independent astroseismic rotation measurements. So these are measures of rotation that have been obtained using the oscillations of stars. We compared, compared these new rotation rates to a standard evolution scenario and one where weak magnetic breaking takes place and found that overwhelmingly the latter is preferred. So these older stars slow down less rapidly and so rotate faster at older ages than we expect. If you're interested in this topic, please come and chat to me or check out my poster. Have a good day, cheers. Hello everyone, I am Eliana Maso. I am a postdoctoral researcher at the IP Institute in Potsdam. And this is the analysis of simultaneous observations of the young Sun Iota horology. That is a star with one of the shortest X-ray cycles and a long-term following up in spectroscopic data. From the Far Beyond the Sun campaign, we obtained around six semesters uh, of observations with Harps Paul. Also, we got two uh, observations using HST, and we complemented our analysis using test photometry. With that photometry and a GPS method that uh, is available in Shapiro et al. 2020, we analyzed the facular to spot ratio of the star, and this analysis told us that the star is spot dominated in its surface. We also uh, cross correlate the multiple uh, observations, uh, and we we're able to recover S index, H alpha, also radial velocities, and to compare the photometric uh, analysis with the Siemens Doppler imaging of the star. With the HST data, we were also able to recover some diagnostic from the transition region in the corona. And stay tuned for our forthcoming publication and stay safe at home. See you. Hello, I am Diego Godoy Rivera from The Ohio State University. Stellar rotation is a fundamental property of stars, and many of the constraints that we have for rotation come from open clusters. Unfortunately, the memberships of these systems are often heavily contaminated by field stars. In this work, we revise the rotational sequences of a sample of open clusters by using the Gaia data to identify the probable cluster members in astrometric phase space. This is illustrated in figure one, where we show the probable cluster members in blue. We then use this to remove the non-member contamination from the rotational sequences of the clusters. This is illustrated in figure two in the period versus temperature diagrams. We do this for all the clusters in our sample and produce revised rotational sequences. These are summarized in figure three, shown as median rotation period as a function of mass and age. For more information, please check out my poster as well as my recent paper with Mark Pinsonal and Luis Arrepo. Thank you for your attention. All right, that's the end of the haiku. So we're back to uh, your session, Sasha. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Scott. Uh, we're perfectly on time. Uh, and so uh, we are going to start uh, with um, Travis uh, and uh, a new understanding of uh, magnetic, no, sorry, a new understanding of magnetic stellar evolution. So um, Travis, 
you have an, uh, I will warn you after nine minutes, okay? At least you have three minutes to, to conclude the before questions. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, <clears throat> Sasha. I really appreciate this opportunity uh, to share with you what I consider uh, the most substantial revision of magnetic stellar evolution in a generation. And I say that because it differs from the standard picture during the entire second half of main sequence lifetimes, which you'll soon see. So what I'll do is I'll review the key developments that led to this new picture, uh, outline our current best understanding of the physical mechanisms that, that drive the, the transition, and finish with the latest results that combined ground-based spectral polarimetry to uh, uh, measure the large-scale magnetic field with uh, space-based astroseismology from TESS. Okay, so we have seen this picture already, but just to summarize, uh, the first half of main sequence lifetimes, um, magnetic evolution is dominated by rotational evolution. So stars are born with a range of initial rotation rates, and they sp spend several million years with their rotation locked to the protostellar disks before contracting onto the main sequence and spinning up slightly. And then uh, magnetic braking uh, kicks in where they gradually lose angular momentum to their magnetized stellar winds. And this process depends strongly on the angular rotation rate. <clears throat> and so stars that are initially rotating more quickly spin down more quickly. And by a half a billion years, uh, stars of a given mass have converged to a common rotation rate. And that continues uh, to the age of the sun, uh, according to this diagram. Uh, and we had basically, uh, as of 2008, we had no data between about 1 billion years and the sun's age. And we certainly had no data, uh, reliable ages in particular, beyond the age of the sun. Um, and so the, the punchline of this presentation is that uh, somewhere around the middle of, of stars' main sequence lifetimes, rotation and magnetic activity actually decouple. So I'll show you the evidence for that. So uh, when astroseismic ages first started to become available for field stars that were older than the sun from Kepler, uh, Ruth Angus and collaborators were the first to notice something unexpected. Uh, they were trying to do fits of empirical gyrochronology relations to both young clusters and old field stars anchored uh, using the sun, which is the red point in this diagram. Uh, and what they found was that the Kepler field stars uh, didn't obey the same, didn't seem to obey the same spin down relations that you would uh, assume if you anchor to young clusters in the sun. Uh, their conclusion in the paper was that no single relation between rotation period, color, and age can ad adequately describe all the subsets of the data. In other words, they found different relations for different um, subgroups of the data. Now, the following year, uh, Jennifer Van Saders and collaborators published a paper in Nature that uh, went a step further. And they basically identified that there was a mass dependence to this behavior, such that hotter stars uh, deviate from the standard spin down relation uh, earlier at faster rotation periods and younger ages than cooler stars. Uh, and that dependence on spectral type suggested a connection to the Rossby number because, so the Rossby number is the rotation period uh, normalized by the convective overturn time. And because stars with different spectral types have different depths of their surface convection zones and, and thus different time scales for convective overturn. Uh, but uh, using that single parameter, the idea that there was a single Rossby number that all of the stars started to deviate from standard spin down, uh, Jennifer and collaborators were able to reproduce the behavior in these old field stars uh, using models that basically, uh, detailed rotational evolution models now, not just uh, empirical uh, fits, detailed rotational evolution models that turned off magnetic braking around the middle of main sequence lifetimes uh, at a Rossby number comparable to the sun. Okay. Now in a follow-up work, we found that this sudden change in rotational behavior also coincided with a change in the properties of stellar activity cycles. So this is a diagram showing the activity cycle period 
versus the rotation period. So keep in mind, this is in years on the vertical axis. It takes a very long time to get these sort of data. Uh, and this is a reproduction of a plot that originally appeared in, uh, in Bohm Vitense 2007 uh, with these two different sequences of activity cycles uh, and the sun in the middle. And this was a long standing puzzle. Well, by looking at a series of solar analogs, 18 SCO at four giga years, Alpha Sen at five and a half, and 16 SIG at seven giga years, uh, this evolutionary sequence suggested that, in fact, once stars hit this critical Rossby number, the cycle period gradually grows longer before disappearing entirely or becoming undetectable. And uh, this same pattern appears for hotter stars here. We're going to look more closely at this pair of hotter, hotter stars at the end and cooler stars as well. And now we have a mechanism for understanding why the sun is between these two stellar sequences that Erica Bonvitens identified. Perhaps the sun is on its way up, evolving slowly on stellar evolution time scales toward longer cycles with lower amplitudes before eventually the cycle will just disappear. Now, the following year, Cecilia Garafo and co collaborators uh, put forward this unifying explanation to, to describe uh, both the existence of persistent fast rotators in young star clusters and these anomalously fast rotating old Kepler field stars. And that was based on the idea of how magnetic complexity uh, evolves uh, as a function of Rossby number. Okay, so um, this vertical axis is a magnetic complexity parameter. You can think of it as the mean spherical harmonic degree of the magnetic field. Uh, and so basically the idea was that in the saturated regime, uh, you have very complex magnetic field that does not strongly couple rotation uh, to, the, to the, uh, the stellar wind. Um, eventually, uh, once you get to the Skumanich regime where stars spin down and their activity levels decrease in tandem with the square root of age, so these two parameters are, are strongly coupled, uh, there you're at the bottom of this relation where the, you're dominated by a dipole field, for example, uh, certainly low order fields. Uh, and then the idea is that late in a star's lifetime, it'll evolve again a more complex magnetic field that uh, decouples rotation and activity once again. And here again are these stars that we'll discuss a little later. Okay. So uh, what do the stars tell us about what is possibly going on uh, to, to explain this kind of behavior? Um, so I'm gonna outline a a four-step process of, of, of how we get from, um, from the Skumanich regime to this decoupled regime. So the first step is that slow rotation becomes non-differential. This is known from uh, MHD modeling where very fast rotators have sort of complex um, uh, Taylor Proudman kind of um, rotation states. But as a star approaches, as the rotation rate of a star approaches the convective overturn time scale in the, con in the convection zone, um, convection stops feeling the Coriolis forces that set up naturally this differential rotation pattern. And you, and you tend toward a state of uniform rotation or possibly anti-differential rotation. Um, and the, so the main point is that as rotation in the limit of rotation rate getting slower, you basically uh, eliminate the ability to produce substantial differential rotation. Now, if you lose that differential rotation, it eliminates the shear that is responsible through the alpha, uh, excuse me, through the omega effect in stellar dynamos from converting a large scale field into smaller scale toroidal field that emerges as active regions. Um, so, you basically are severing the dynamo loop if you uh, believe in something like an alpha omega dynamo uh, in the sun and sun-like stars. Uh, so uh, the loss of differential rotation severs the dynamo loop. Uh, that's important because the large scale field, the largest scale field that you produce um, from the dynamo is the, the uh, field that most strongly couples the rotational evolution of the star through its magnetized stellar wind. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. 
So the um, the dipole field, for example, uh, is response. So charged particles in the stellar wind are tied to the magnetic field lines until they approach the uh, critical distance known as the alphane radius, where they then shed the angular momentum. And that alphane radius is by far much larger for the dipole component of the field and gets much smaller for higher, progressively higher order components. So if you eliminate the dipole field because you've severed the dynamo loop, uh, you lose your ability uh, to efficiently shed angular momentum and change the rotation rate over time. And we know that stars uh, gradually, their global dynamos shut down just empirically. That's true in the Mount Wilson survey. Young stars have high activity levels, high levels of variability, complex multi-periodic variability. But as they evolve, their average activity level comes down. They become less variable, more monoperiodic until eventually you get these so-called flat activity stars uh, where it, either there's no more large scale variation, um, cyclic variation in the magnetic field or we simply can no longer detect it because it's too small. Okay, so on to our uh, recent results from LBT spectropolarimetry combined with um, astroseismology from TESS. Um, now, if you want to determine the morphology of the magnetic field in the large scale mor morphology, spectropolarimetry is the tool of choice because it's most sensitive to dipole field. And then it progressively gets less and less sensitive because of geometric cancellation effects to higher order components. So you can think of spectropolarimetry as a, as a spatial filter to detect or not detect large scale field. And then you can use calcium H and K emission or some other magnetic proxy that's insensitive to polarity to define the relative activity levels overall. And so when we, when we looked at this hot pair of stars where the active star 88 Leo is, you know, shows normal cycles on, the, um, on both branches of, of the activity um, rotation relation, uh, we actually detect a clear signature of a large scale magnetic field dominated by a dipole with a strength of about two and a half gauss. For the inactive star that's a flat activity star at a very similar rotation rate, we know its relative activity level from chromospheric emission. So it should be about three quarters as strong as 88 Leo. So if you just scale down that detection in 88 Leo by three quarters, you would expect to see a 1.9 gauss field, uh, dipole field in Rho Corbor um, if you didn't change the, the geometry. But in fact, we set an upper limit on the dipole field in this star of uh, half a gauss. And so the magnet, large scale magnetic field is dominated in Rho Corbor, Corbor by the quadrupole and higher order fields, uh, just as we predicted. And very recently, we were able to get an astroseismic age for Rho Corbor uh, and put it on this diagram. So the background gray points are the uh, activity age relation from Lorenzo Oliveira for a, a sample of solar analogs. Uh, and the blue points are test astroseismic targets that we've put on there. With the exception of 88 Leo, this is the gyro age of that star. <clears throat> now, uh, so the astroseismic age of Rho Corbor uh, places it out here at nearly 10 giga years. Uh, if you determine the age of Rho Corbor from its rotation period, so the gyrochronology age is, is way down here. Um, now, both of them are below the, the sequence for solar analogs, and that's expected. They're more massive stars, thinner convection zones. And so, of course, at a given age, more massive stars are more evolved, and so you'd expect them to be less active. Uh, so this is just the mass dependence of the activity age relation. And we're working now to try to define uh, in detail in detail this activity age relation for uh, uh, all of the test astroseismic targets that we can get our hands on. Um, okay, so with that, I will put up my summary of conclusions uh, and take your questions. Thank you for this uh, excellent talk. Um, I have um, some questions. So um, first uh, question by Lauren. Um, even if the cyclic dynamo shut down, is there also evidence that the total amplitude of field becomes decoupled from the rotation? Or could there still be a steady field with the ability to affect the spin down? I'm sorry, can you just repeat that? I didn't catch. I say. Um, even if the cyclic dynamo shuts down, is there also evidence 
that the total amplitude of field becomes decoupled from the rotation? Or could there still be a steady field with the ability to affect the spin down? Uh, there is certainly uh, still a steady field. Um, you, you can measure the calcium H and K uh, emission in these stars. Um, and we think what happened, but, but it has no influence on the, almost no influence on the spin down anymore. And the reason is we think that this transition represents the loss of large scale field is what decouples the evolution of activity and rotation. You still have activity on small scales, say a local surface dynamo. So it's building field um, through an alpha effect driven by mechanical energy from convection. Um, and that will continue to evolve with time as we saw with the solar analog sample. You, you can, you, uh, the age, uh, activity age relation is continuous. Uh, unlike the activity rotation, or sorry, the rotation age relation. So, so yes, it, it's the disappearance of the large scale field that, that is the event that decouples, effectively decouples the evolution of rotation and activity, uh, but there's still activity to be measured on small scales. Um, so we, we are short of time. Uh, so just one last question, and then you can answer the questions in the Slack and chat, uh, Travis. Uh, a question from Günther. For too slow rotation, any large scale dynamo should die together with the differential rotation. You already see this limit. What was that last part? I didn't catch the last you bit. You already see this limit. The uh, limit where the global dynamo shuts down? We think we do. Where the large scale dynamo shuts down. Yeah, the, the large scale dynamo shut. That's what we think we're seeing. Um, admittedly, there are few observational constraints uh, right now uh, because we've only done these measurements for one set of stars like this, but um, there are more. We actually have LBT time this semester, this semester to do uh, a sample of five additional G-type stars. And so we're hoping that there will be additional evidence very soon. Okay, thank you, uh, Travis. I let you answer the other questions in the uh, in the chat and the Slack, and I'm moving to the next talk, which is by uh, Ryan Terrien, modulated Zeeman signatures as spectroscopic tracers of M dwarf stellar rotation. I will warn you after nine minutes. All right, thank you. All right, so uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to come and share with all of you uh, some of the work we're doing measuring Mborf rotation and uh, magnetism uh, with the Habitable Zone Planet Finder. Uh, so this is uh, work that's being done in collaboration with several members of the Habitable Zone Planet Finder team that you can see listed there. And, and that includes uh, several students at Carleton that I've had the opportunity to work with. So that's Katie, Allie, Freya, and Adam. So I'll start off with the, I'm sure, uncontroversial assertion that uh, the ability to measure uh, M-dwarf rotation is important. Uh, it's important if you are interested in detecting and characterizing exoplanets, uh, in part because the stellar activity and rotation confuses the detection of those exoplanetary signals, and um, in part because uh, just the environment that the, the star and the planet help co-create um, is, is very interesting, as we've seen some other uh, uh, talks reference uh, at this conference. Um, and measuring stellar rotation is equally important uh, if you're at all interested in any questions about stellar physics, right? And so all the interesting questions discussed here uh, about the interior structures of these stars and how that interior structure evolves and drives the magnetic phenomena or doesn't um, that we observe. Um, these are all uh, dependent on your ability to measure the rotation of these stars. And at the same time, uh, doing that is, is quite difficult in some cases, and in particular for the stars um, that are the latest type M dwarfs that might be fully convective uh, and which are often slowly rotating. And so I'll uh, hold up as an example here, one of the, the nearest and best studied uh, late type M dwarfs, uh, Barnard star, GJ699, uh, for which um, Toledo Padron and collaborators recently uh, compiled uh, you know, more than a decade's worth of spectroscopy and photometry. And uh, you see on the, the right-hand side here, uh, the periodogram analysis of uh, several of the activity indicators that they looked at with the uh, rotation period uh, that they found highlighted. 
And it was really only after uh, you know, combining this huge data set and a, a very careful and thorough analysis that they were able to, to detect the 145 uh, day rotation period of this uh, older, slowly rotating late type M dwarf. And I will argue here that um, there's the potential of maybe getting a, a, another useful handle on um, sort of rotation metrics for these types of stars because of the increasing availability of high quality spectra of them. And this is driven in part by uh, a bunch of newly available red and near infrared spectrographs, uh, several of which are um, explicitly designed for detecting exoplanets around these uh, types of stars. And um, in particular, in those cases, right, these, these instruments are designed with high stability, high resolution um, as sort of uh, design principles, and they get used to observe the same M dwarfs over and over and over again for uh, long periods of time. And so these data sets and these instruments present uh, an opportunity to sort of go exploring for uh, the potential hints of, of rotation and uh, magnetic activity in uh, just the intensity spectra. So um, we don't have a polarimeter and I'm not talking about polarimetry in this talk, just uh, the intensity spectra. And uh, sort of seeing what we can do there. And this, this work builds on uh, sort of a long heritage of uh, uh, important work that's sort of demonstrated the use of intensity spectra of, of low mass stars for measuring properties of their uh, magnetic fields, including the geometry, the strength, um, and connecting that to rotation in many cases as well. So the instrument that we are using is uh, called the Habitable Zone Planet Finder. This is a, a near infrared spectrograph that covers 800 nanometers through the J band uh, at fairly high resolution of uh, around 50,000. Um, it's on a, a large telescope, the 10 meter Hobby Elberly telescope, and it has um, a very nice laser frequency cone calibrator. So uh, this instrument is very well calibrated. It's very stable um, and it presents a unique opportunity for, for doing this kind of exploratory work, looking for the small, potentially subtle changes that might be uh, connected to changes, uh, rotation and changes in the um, magnetic activity of these stars. And I'll just note that HPF uh, enables a lot of other exciting science as well. So you might check out uh, posters by Stephenson and Neenan at this conference as well. And so again, we're talking about intensity spectra here of, of a particular resolution. So what do I mean when I'm talking about the magnetic signatures? Um, specifically, I mean Zeeman broadening and intensification. Um, as you probably know, uh, when a spectral line is uh, formed uh, in the presence of a magnetic field, um, the components of that line can actually split. And uh, what you're seeing here is sort of a simulated classical triplet um, formed uh, in the absence of a magnetic field and in the presence of one. And the effects that we would see in sort of habitable zone planet finder resolution spectra of, of, of this line would be on the one hand that the line gets wider in the presence of the magnetic field, that's the Zeeman broadening, and on the other hand that the line actually gets stronger, and by that I mean the integrated area under this line uh, gets stronger. And those signatures are uh, not constant across the whole spectrum of a given star. Um, it depends on the electronic configuration and the wavelength that you're doing the observing at. And this is the relationship to keep in mind uh, when you think about that. So this is telling us that the, um, the wavelength separation between the different split components, like we saw on the previous slide, uh, is dependent on the magnetic field strength, right? So it's stronger with stronger magnetic fields. Um, but it's also proportional to uh, this parameter, the effective Lande factor, which essentially conveys the severity of the magnetic splitting of the electronic energy levels. And it also depends on the square of the wavelength that you're um, making the measurement at. So this uh, Zeeman effect gets stronger with increasing wavelength. So those are sort of the contours of the effects uh, to have in mind here. And so let's actually look at some HPF data. So this is uh, again, spectra of Barnard's star. Um, it's a nice standard, so we'll keep coming back to it. Um, and two lines, it's sort of the blue and the red end, an iron line on the left and a potassium line on the right. These are both uh, rather strong lines, and they're also in regions that are uh, fairly clean of telluric absorption. They have sort of fairly typical levels of magnetic sensitivity. Their Lande factors are around 1.6. And we're confident that we've sort of correctly identified these lines and are correctly attributing magnetic behavior to them because we can see them clearly in um, solar spectra of the photosphere and uh, in spots where there is a, a strong magnetic field. And in both cases, um, these lines show unambiguously the expected Zeeman uh, pattern. And what's more, uh, 
if we actually point HPF at a at an M dwarf, which is uh, known to have a strong surface magnetic field, uh, in this case AD Leo, uh, we once again see um, unambiguously uh, the split profile that we expect to see in this case. So we know that. Um, uh, well, among others, we know that these two lines uh, individually are um, both cleanly measurable and magnetically sensitive. And so the question then becomes, uh, with a long baseline of, of data on Barnard's star, do we see any variations in the high SNR spectra that might point back to rotational modulation in the Zeeman effect? Uh, so the first set of data that I'd like to show here is uh, focused on sort of the intensification or the line strength angle. Um, and before I click play here, uh, the, the panels here are showing on the left side, the iron line, on the right side, the potassium line that we identified previously. Uh, the middle panels are showing the line profile itself, and you'll see that jitter through time, but not much. Um, and so to highlight the differences as time goes on, the top panels actually show uh, sort of the difference from the first epoch. And the bottom is showing the equivalent width or you know, probably the pseudo equivalent with essentially the strength of the line integrated, integrated between the, the gray vertical lines in each case. And so I could play on this. And as you watch this go, uh, what I will note is that the, um, you know, if the, if the Zeeman effect is what's driving the variations that we're seeing here, you'd expect sort of uh, narrowing and weakening to exhibit a pattern like the, the blue pattern we see in the differences on those top panels. And if in, if the line is getting broader and stronger, you'd expect to see this kind of a signature. And so certainly as you uh, progress through and see the higher equivalent width values here, um, this signature is, is pretty clearly popping up above, above the noise um, in both cases. So we see this. Oh, and the other thing I'll note here is that the time baseline shown here is about that 145 day rotation period that was established for Barnard Star. Three minutes. Thank you. So uh, that's the line strengths. We see some uh, uh, in, you know, hints of Zeeman intensification there. Uh, how about the line widths? And uh, look at a slightly different kind of metric to, to establish this. Um, what this is showing is over that same time period, uh, this quantity called the differential line width, which is telling us something about how the average line width uh, of all the lines across the spectrum that we're using uh, is varying. And if you're not familiar with this quantity, it's kind of analogous to the full width half max of a cross correlation function, uh, but it performs a bit better for uh, M dwarfs, which have complex spectra. And what we're seeing here again is, is a very clear modulation. Um, and this is even more significantly above uh, what appears to be sort of the noise in this measurement, again, over the same time baseline here. And what's more is uh, you can break up this um, this measurement by wavelength. So instead of looking at the whole uh, spectrum of Barnard star, we can break it up by individual spectral orders. And in this case, look at just like a blue sort of middle of the road and then red orders. And in the case where Zeeman broadening is driving the variations that we see, um, we, would, we might expect to see uh, more extreme variations for the redder wavelengths. And in fact, um, there are indications in our data that that is uh, what we're seeing here when we break it down that way. So we do see this sort of chromaticity in the line width variations. And um, the next point that I'll make here is just if I stack these indicators up on top of each other, these are all the, the data points that you've seen already, but aligned in time, um, they pretty clearly phase up with each other as well. The potassium equivalent width, the iron equivalent width, and the, the line width uh, value itself. And finally, if I, um, uh, you know, this is, this is all preliminary, but if we um, plug those indicators into a periodogram analysis, um, in each case, we do see power uh, popping up uh, sort of near the rotation, near the known rotation uh, period for this star. And so these all seem to be pointing at sort of a, a common origin that's consistent with uh, the Zeeman effect uh, driving the variations that we see. So where does this leave us? Um, we haven't done anything terribly complicated here, right? We're just looking very carefully at how a, a couple of features are varying in high signal to noise spectra of this well-studied standard star. Uh, but we do see periodic changes in the strengths and the widths of, of lines um, that we're looking at. Um, and this behavior seems to be consistent with um, what you might expect from rotationally modulated uh, Zeeman effects. And I'm saying this one because yes, the, the periodicity seems consistent with the known rotation period of the star. Um, the line strengths and widths seem to vary in phase with each other, 
which again was what you'd expect. And we do see this chromaticity uh, for the line width variations that is, is consistent with what we'd expect. And so uh, work is ongoing to sort of uh, show that the, the relative magnitudes of these changes are consistent with um, sort of realistic expectations for um, the kinds of magnetic fields and surface geometries that you might have on uh, the surface of these stars, uh, but it's exciting. And I'd say maybe some of the implications here are, uh, okay, in one case, there is uh, potentially um, in these line widths and the equivalent widths of these features um, that are magnetically sensitive, potentially a handle on uh, measuring the rotation periods for stars where this presents a difficulty like Barnard star. Um, and that's particularly valuable if you're interested in detecting exoplanets because having some handle on the rotation period there is absolutely vital for uh, informing your Gaussian process uh, technique or, or however you're correcting for the activity related signals that might pop up in your uh, Doppler signals, your Doppler measurements, for example. And I'd say just in general, this, this does indicate that there's uh, sort of recoverable information in the intensity spectra about the magnetic field geometry of these stars. And so that is, um, I think, quite exciting. And uh, we're excited to work on this more. And I'll just, uh, as a final note here, note that there are uh, several other works being presented at this conference, which touch on related topics. So um, if you're interested in these types of things, I would definitely uh, uh, suggest that you take a look at those uh, posters as well. Um, so I think that's all I've got. And thanks for your uh, attention. Thank you for your talk. We have time for one question. Uh, by uh, Yutanotsu. Is it possible to estimate spot coverage from these variations of line profiles? Yeah, so that seems like it could be a, um, it could be something that you could assess by looking at the, the differences in um, the behavior for these different lines. Um, there are a number of other effects that might come into play here on the different uh, effects of non-LTE or the effects of, um, you know, different, uh, I guess, how the, how the different temperature contrasts for the spots might imprint differently on the lines. And so I think that there's uh, potential for that, but I, I don't know enough yet to say whether uh, those would be very tight constraints. Okay, one last question. Um, how can the spot for or active region lifetime affects the measurements of rotational modulation for such slowly rotating stars. For example, sunspot lifetimes are typically less than one than months. Yeah, so that certainly is a, a challenge for um, these types of measurements, as is uh, differential rotation. Um, so at some level, uh, sort of deconfusing your measurements. Uh, between the activity cycles and the various periodicities involved there and um, the things that might just be pure rotation uh, would remain uh, a challenging issue for these types of measurements as well. Um, but in general, the more handles you have on those activity related signals, um, the, the better your result will be. Okay, thank you. We have to move on. So there are several questions. Uh, check on the chat and on the Slack. Uh, there are some people who have asked uh, other questions. And we go to the last talk, uh, which is by uh, Antonio Milon, um, multiple stellar population among very, very low mass stars. Uh, go ahead. Do you hear me? Yes, we do. But we don't see your slides. Uh, why am I? Yeah. Okay. Hello, everybody, and thank mm -hmm. you for this opportunity. I will come back to the discussion on multiple stellar populations in globular clusters, and I will uh, try to constrain the formation scenarios with the two new results. And of course, I'm going to present the work of many people. Let me first thank the group of uh, astronomers in Padova. That includes a lot of uh, young, uh, brilliant uh, uh, astronomers. And uh, OK, the story started about 10 years ago. And, um, and um, OK, 
10 years ago, we realized that the, if we combine appropriate combination of filters with the Hubble Space Telescope, then the color magnitude diagram of the globular clusters that traditionally was considered the prototype of the single isochrome, then it became a very complex structure. It became made of multiple sequences that can be followed continuously along the entire diagram. Uh, we realize also that the, when we move from one color combination to another, we see different stories. For example, this is a diagram that is sensitive to variation in nitrogen, and this is 28 to 8, a cluster with clearly evidence of multiple populations with different nitrogen. But if we move to this other color combination, it looks a completely different story. This is a color combination that is sensitive to helium. So what we did is try to combine this super color magnitude diagram and derive a new tool to maximize the information on multiple stellar populations. And this tool is nicknamed the chromosome map. I tell you how to derive a chromosome map very quickly. So we just take the two super diagrams, the one sensitive to helium, the other sensitive to nitrogen. I show you how to do it for the Regian branch. Of course, we can do it for all the other evolutionary sequences of the cluster. So let's zoom in on the Regian branch. Black stars are giants. Uh, derive the boundaries, blue and red boundaries of the giants, and start to verticalize the Regian branch. This way, we get these delta quantities. And when we plot one delta quantity against the other, we have this plot that is the chromosome map and the reveals the complexity of stellar populations in these globular clusters. You see, this is what we expect from a simple stellar populations, and this is what we observe in the real globular cluster. We first distinguish two main group of stars. I call it first and second generation. But then if you go in details, you see that the second generation is actually composed of uh, uh, subpopulations. And even the first population, that is the population composed of stars with the pristine chemical composition, even the first population is not chemically homogeneous. This means that the pristine gas from which first generation star formed are uh, not homogeneous. And the, this global cluster provides the opportunity to constrain the chemical composition of the pristine gas. And please have a look at this poster where uh, there are some updates. But anyway, once we find the tool, once we derive the chromosome map for a cluster, then we can extend the method to a large sample of clusters. And this is a beautiful picture from our atlas of multiple populations in globular clusters. And you immediately see the complexity of the multiple population phenomenon. You see that the situation changes dramatically from one cluster to another. The number of populations differs from one cluster to another. The extension of the map changes from cluster to clusters. And also the relative numbers of first and second generation stars changes from cluster to clusters. This is a, a work based on region brain stars, but of course we can extend the analysis to the other sequences. This is a, another beautiful picture derived by Emanuele Dondoglio. And this is about the horizontal branch, the right horizontal branch. Again, we have complexity, we have variety, and we can derive the fraction of first and second generation stars. And of course, we can extend the work to the ATV stars. This is work by a joy and collaborator. Uh, OK. So these are the observational tools that we have for globular cluster. We try to use this tool now to constrain the formation of globular clusters. Uh, some of you already uh, discussed about the scenarios for the formation of multiple populations. I will summarize in two main group of scenarios. I know that is not, not entirely correct, but okay. First scenario is multiple generation scenarios. We have multiple bars of star formation. And this scenario implies that globular clusters were significantly more massive at formation, that they have lost a significant fraction of their first generation in the galaxy. And so these gigantic globular clusters, according to these scenarios, were responsible for the assembly of the galactic halo and maybe for the rayonization of the universe. Alternative scenarios suggest that there are no multiple generation stars, all stars formed at the same time. 
And the crazy chemical composition that we observe in second generation stars actually is the product of accretion of material that has been polluted by stars from the same generation. Try to constrain the models, to the scenarios from the observations. So one thing that I say is that the fraction of first generation changes from cluster to clusters. And we have this clear correlation with the cluster mass. More massive clusters have a lot of uh, set of first generation stars, up to 60% in the Milky Way. High massive clusters have a few percent of the second generation star, of first generation stars. But we also know that there is a, a scatter. Clusters with the same mass can have different fraction of first generation stars. So we need to a second parameter at least to, to understand this phenomenon. And the interesting work by Marco Zennaro is the search for this second parameter. And what he found is that if we take clusters that have orbits that are distant from the Milky Way center, clusters with the large perigalactic radius, actually they have higher fraction of first generation stars than the remaining clusters of the Milky Way. And then the situation is even more dramatic if we go to the Magellanic clouds. Magellanic cloud globular clusters are even dominated by the first generation that can be as high as 80% if we assume that these clusters actually have second generation stars in terms of uh, multiple populations as we mean in that globular cluster. Based on this plot, we can also use other parameters. So here we have the present day mass, but we can use, uh, for example, the initial masses from Baumgart and Dirkert. And what we see is that this relation became more well-defined and that the significance became higher and higher when we use initial mass masses. But we can plot against other quantities. For example, we see that there is a mild correlation with the, the mass of the first generation and a, a very strong correlation with the mass of the second generation. What does it mean? To investigate this phenomenon, we use simulation. This is our input simulation where we assume that the pristine globular primordial globular clusters were dominated by the first generation and that they preferentially lose their first generation. We run the simulation and this is the result. The result actually is that we match perfectly all the observation. Poor correlation with the one first generation mass, strong correlation with the initial mass, strong correlation with the second generation mass. So conclusion, our observation of first and second generation stars in Milky Way Magellan cloud clusters are consistent with the scenario where globular clusters were more massive by a factor of about 10 at formation, and they preferentially lost their first generation. Second constraint. The second constraint is based on a limitation. That, thank you. On a limitation that we have from the observational point of view. And the, the limitation is that most of the studies of multiple populations are based on massive stars. Massive stars, I mean stars more massive than 0 0.6 solar masses. And this is because uh, we can only investigate multiple population in Regina branch and bright main sequence stars because uh, most of the studies are based on the ultraviolet and it is not possible to get with present day instrumentation precise photometry in the ultraviolet for faint stars. So we need a new tool to investigate the majority of cluster stars uh, because all this region that is, the, is most of the mass in stars of global cluster is completely unexplored. And the, the solution is provided by water, by water in stars, and by other molecules, of course. This is uh, the comparison of the spectra of first and second population stars in globular clusters. And you see that the, there is a huge difference in fluxes when we approach the near infrared. And uh, this difference in flux translates into difference in uh, photometry. What's the implication? The implication is that an assumption of the second scenario is that second generation stars formed by accretion. And uh, if uh, the accretion 
accord with the, a, a law like the bonding accretion, then we expect that the amount of polluted material is proportional to the square of the stellar mass. So what we expect, these are simulated CFDs, is that if the scenario is, uh, of accretion is correct, we have a small variations in chemical composition. So small variation, small, small photometric spread when we observe very low mass stars in contrast to what we expect in the multiple generation scenarios. So what we can do is just taking a cluster that is well studied in terms of uh, regional branch stars. So this is for example, 6752. It is well studied by David Young, who is a, a guru for stellar spectroscopy. And uh, he derived very precise abundances of uh, oxygen for regional branch stars. We have three population, A, B, and C. And uh, okay, what is going on at the, the very low mass regime? We got high precision photometry from Hubble Space Telescope. These are deep observations. I'm very excited because we, in, in the future, because in the future, in the next years, we will have JWST to extend this work to large sample of clusters to high precision levels. But still, with the Hubble Space Telescope for nearby clusters, we are able to discover multiple populations among very low mass stars. And so now we, the missing point is the chemical composition for these stars. This is possible by comparing the multi-wavelength photometry from HST with appropriate uh, stellar models, with appropriate synthetic spectra and isochrons. And okay, this is uh, what we expect in case of three stellar populations with the same content of oxygen. You see, we do not fit the data at all. But if we take three stellar populations and associate to the three stellar population the same chemical composition inferred by David Young for massive regime branch stars, then this is the result. We have a perfect fit. So the solution, the, the conclusion is that the multiple population of low mass stars, multiple population at the bottom of the main sequence with masses of about 0.2 solar masses, share the same chemical composition as uh, multiple populations among massive stars. And these exclude every scenario where the second generation formed through body-like accretion of the material polluted by massive stars. And this is the last slide of uh, my talk. These are just a couple of examples to show how we can constrain the formation of multiple stellar populations in globular clusters by using present day facilities, but we will do better we I'm very excited about the future and about the JWST, which will open really new windows on this kind of studies. And of course, I have to thank all my collaborators. Sorry if I didn't list all of them in this slide. And please have a look at these interesting posters about uh, uh, the research uh, that is led by young scientists in, uh, in, in, in Padova. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Antonio. Uh, we have one, Antonio, one question by Corinne, uh, which is asking, can you please explain what kind of simulation you did or showed to eject the first generation? Ciao, Corinne, how are you? It's a, it's a, very, it's a very simple uh, simulation. It's, it's, it's just, uh, I started from, uh, where is the slide? Ah, sorry. I just started from. Oh, I, started, I, just, I just started from um, from this um, initial uh, input of a uh, uh, fraction of first generation stars against the initial cluster mass. You see that I assumed a, a, a variation of the fraction of first generation against the mass. And I assume that clusters are uh, kind of dominated by the first generation. And uh, I just let the cluster lose the first uh, generation by means of uh, Monte Carlo. I just randomly excluded first generation stars. It's nothing, com it's not, it's something very simple. It's something very naive. It's not as complex as uh, the, nice work that you used to do. But still with this very simple Monte Carlo simulation, we come out with this, uh, this, uh, this result. And actually we have a kind of perfect match 
with the, all the uh, observations. So in particular, uh, I was surprised by this uh, fact that there is, um, in, in the data, there is a mild or no correlation maybe with the, the fraction, uh, with the mass of the first generation, while there is a strong correlation with the mass of the second generation. And uh, well, this is, uh, by, by using this naive, simple approach, uh, actually we reproduce very well all this plot. And I, I hope, of course, that the more sophisticated simulation, maybe in the context of the different uh, scenarios, will, uh, will uh, come out. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we, uh, this will be the end of the talks of the CoolStar uh, 20.5 virtual session. I want to thank everybody for attending uh, these few days. Uh, we are looking forward to see you in Toulouse. So for the one who are not there when I started the session, uh, uh, I recall you that uh, we will be uh, in Toulouse in, uh, on the 4th and 9th of July of next year. And that uh, uh, Splinter call will be open in October and re op registration open in January of next year, 2022. Places are limited to 500 persons, so uh, please uh, register early. Uh, I guess uh, Scott uh, is around, maybe wants to speak, uh, say a few words before. Uh, uh, no, I think you've, <laughs> yes. you've, you've said everything I'm going to say, which is um, what we're going to, so two things. What we're going to do now is we're going to go back to the breakout rooms. You should be able to look up in the breakout rooms and find your topical interest room. Um, if you can't, I'll hang on the line here for a couple of minutes while Sean and I straighten all those out. I want to thank everyone for coming. I want to say, you know, we, we basically never dipped down below about 300, 350 people actively involved. The Slack was amazing. I do want to see you all in person. This is not a complete substitute for what could have been and what will be. And I'm very much looking forward to seeing many, many, many of you in Toulouse in about 16 months. But for now, thank you and get to the breakout rooms and get on to Gather Town and we'll see you all very soon. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you, Scott. And everybody uh, at CFA. Scott, the uh, breakout rooms are populating now, but I'll stick around. If anybody is unable to get into the room, I can come in. So, yep. And Sean, I assume you're seeing the various thank yous. Thank you for making all this work. How do we no, get no. to the breakout rooms? <laughs> In the bottom of you now, um, Sean, make sure that Andrea isn't still a co host because co hosts cannot get into the breakout room. Oh, <laughs> take me away. <laughs> yep. So I'll do the same. So, do I Andrea. Once you're not a co-host, the breakout room should appear underneath you. And then I'll quickly pop into each of them before I have to. Okay, yeah. Oh, here they are. Sasha, I'll remove you, your panel as well. How do yep. we select it? I see the break and rope with people feeling it. Uh, well, how do we go okay, there? So we're going to make you not a co-host first. Yep. Turn I just out host. Okay, I'm co host. This is why I cannot yeah. go. Okay. Host cannot leave the meeting, is the problem. Okay. So now you should not be a host anymore. All right, Sacha, thank you thank so you much. Thank you, everybody, and uh, see you at, the, at one of the break room and we catch up uh, for the Focus yeah, Start well, 21 soon. Bye bye. Yeah, when the back together, I, we have a long list of things we've learned here. I can't get into that. Uh, you're a, just a guest now, so you should be able to enter. Them. Which room are you trying to get into? I'm trying to get into Evolve Cool Stars, and it's at the very bottom, and it keeps flipping off the screen. Oh, wait a minute. There it is. It came back. Okay. Whoa. There we go. Zoom button. Jump around. I, there, I hope. <laughs> well, no, I clicked on it, and it it's not going. Should it just go there? I sure. Let me see if I can find you in the list. Of all cool stars, it's at the very bottom and it keeps flipping off.
Well, maybe something just happened. Uh, let's see. Sorry, Sean. Oh, now I lost everything in the. Oh, yeah. Leanne wants to go into that too. Okay. I just found you in the list. Let me try to put you into Evolved. Okay, join. 